Same akani se rashaba Same akani se rashaba Same akani ani ohe mayom shel yahuwa Se mayom hato Same akani se mayom hato Same akani se mayom hato Same akani ani Elohe Avraham Yitzchak with Israel, Elohe Avotenu with Eli, Lishmo Abokolina, Imterese Otka, Lama Anshim Ka Yehovah, Blessed be Yah in the morning, Blessed be Yah in the afternoon, Blessed be Yah in the evening, Blessed be Yah in the night, Blessed be Yah every day, Blessed be Yah always. Yah our power, please forgive us for all evil things we have done. Be with us all this day for thy name's sake, Yahuwah. 
power of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Israel, power of our fathers, and my power. Hearken to my voice, I pray thee, if it pleaseth thee, for thy name's sake. Hallelujah. Your kind. Blessed art thou, O Yehoah, our power, and blessed be the works of thy hands. And the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, Yah finished his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day and hallowed it, because that in it he rested from all his work, which Yah created and had made. O thou who art most holy, look upon thy people in mercy. Hear thou us, O power of Abraham. Nurture us, O power of Yitzchak. Blot us not out, O Yah, though our sins be many, but cast our evil doings into the bottomless pit. To remain forevermore. Our hope is in thee, O Yah, and without thy mercy we have naught. Father of wisdom, thou dispenser of knowledge, cause our hearts to discern and our minds to retain thy law. Israel to know thee as we did in the days of yore. Let the sign of the Shabbat shine brightly from this thine house, and from us thy people, Yisrael. Let our voices mingle with the host of heaven, as we joyfully proclaim. Blessed be the name of our power, and blessed be his holy day. Amen. Shema. Shema. Yisrael. glad and rejoice thereon. Unto thee do I lift up mine eyes, O thou that art enthroned in the heaven. Ascribe unto Jehovah the glory due unto his name. Worship Jehovah in the beauty of holiness. In thee, O Yah, do I take refuge. Let me never be ashamed. Thou hast given us joy in the place of sorrow. Thy truth is like a heady wine. Shout for joy, O ye children of Israel. Proclaim the name of our king, to whom the sun doth shine and the wind sing. Jehovah is our shun and shield, who then come master us. To thee, power of our fathers, do we give honor and glory. For who is Yah besides thee? Be thou our judge, O Yah, against the ungodly nations. Save us, O our king, we beseech thee. Then shall we come clapping, singing, jumping. Shout, praise, and crying, and extolling thy holy name. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy life do we see light. Thy loving kindness, Yah, is thy faithfulness reaches unto the sky. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore in peace. For Jehovah loveth justice, and forsaken not his holy ones. Hallelujah. Shema. Shema. Israel
Call our father from Chaldea. Art thou not he, O power of Israel? He is. Where is the power of Yitzchak, who did bless him with the righteous Rivqua? Thou art one and the same. Who knoweth him who changed Yaakov's name? Thou, O Yah, will forever remain. Though Yosef sojourn in Egypt, yet did all men show him favor. Thy hand, O Yah, was with him. Thou didst help Moshe and Yisrael against Pharaoh. Who stood up the mighty Red Sea? Manna dropped from heaven to sustain thy people in the wilderness. They fashioned a calf to bow down to. Yet to Israel did his style show mercy. We give thanks unto thee, O Yah, and we will tell of thy wondrous works. In Yehuda's Yah, his name is Israel. His foundation is in the holy mountain. We will sing of the mercies of Yehoah forever. Unto all generations we will make them to be known. Stay thou, O Yah, in the midst of us. Cause righteousness once more to be sown. So shall the heavens praise thy wonders, Yah. Thy faithfulness in the holy assembly. Let Yisrael awaken the day with their praises. Glory to Yah, now and forevermore. Hallelujah. Shema. Shema. Israel, oh, ah. Earnestly will I seek thee. Hear my voice, merciful Father. Preserve me from mine enemies. Send out thine angels to protect me. O oh, thou that hear I got, I got it. With thy mighty hand, Yah, all those that hate us. Remember us in mercy, Yah, and pardon all our transgressions. No, I'm saying with the How could we hope to prosper unless our Creator protect us? We are as if we had not been. Say thy hand, O death, for he doth forgive our iniquities. So will I sing praises to his name, that I may perform my vow. The dead praise not Jehovah, nay, nor any that go down into silence. Let us extol our power while we have life. Sing praises to our power while we have any being. Together we will lift up our voices and gratefully sing. Withhold not thy voice from extolling our maker, the young and old praise him together. Let the tribes come near and testify. Even the tribes of Israel, the mighty of Jehovah. Stay among the nations. Jehovah reigneth. Thy power, Israel, over all the world. 
For Jehovah will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness become a thy house. Now, O oh Yah, and forevermore. Hallelujah. Shema. Shema. Yisrael. Yahuwah. Eloheinu. Yahuwah. Eloheinu. Yahuwah. Echad. Ba. Hallelujah. At this time, we would like to even turn it over to DCB. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so that anytime we upload a new video, you'll be notified. Thank you. Shalom, shalom, family. Once again, Congregation Bay DCB presents a day of praise to the Most High. Unity Shabbat Kum, we must rise. The date, May 28th, 2022. That's Memorial Day weekend. The place, Restoration Plaza, 1368 Fulton Street, Brooklyn, New York. Services will begin at 11 a.m. sharp. For information, please contact us at 347-622-9090 or info at baydcb.org. You won't want to miss this event. Once again, Congregation Bay DCB presents a day of praise to the Most High. Unity Shabbat Kum, we must rise. The date is May 28, 2022. That's the Memorial Day weekend at the Restoration Plaza, 1368 Fulton Street, Brooklyn, New York. Services will begin at 11 a.m. sharply. For more info, please contact us at 347-622-9090 or at info at baydcb.org. You won't want to miss this. Shalom, shalom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be your whole our king. You may be seated. Thank you to Most High King for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanking the Creator for our lives. The life of Kobe Yisrael scattered in the four corners of the earth. And we thank the Most High God that He's been with us through all of our endeavors, Amen. the good and the bad. Because in the good, we feel good, but in the bad, we get to learn. Right. <laughs> so we thank the Creator for being able to learn mm. and um, having us here today. Listen, it's a blessing to be here because there's a lot of people that are not here today. Mm. I seen that um, in Chicago in a 12 hour period, seven people got murdered. Mm. Um, four at a restaurant, two of them were brothers and the mother worked in the restaurant so the, the sons got killed in front of the mother. Um, the other one was a pregnant woman, four months pregnant, shot in the head. And the other two were a man and a woman in a vehicle and a shorefront where there's water, both of them shot, rival gangs or whatever. So we got to be thankful for what we have. And we always got to glorify this great king for what he has given us, which is life. When you got life, you have a chance. And we can't take life for granted. We can't take it for granted because people are leaving this earth on a daily basis for no reason whatsoever. But God know the reason because he's the judge. We might look at things and we might say, what a tragedy. But the most high God is the one that has everything in his sight and has everything in store and has everything lined up to happen just exactly the way that he wanted to happen. It's like I said, we all have two roads, right? We have a good road and a bad road. But it's up to the road you want to take. Whether you want to go to the right road or you want to go to the wrong road. If you choose the right way, 
God will give you all the blessings that he's promised us. Right. But if you choose the wrong way, then everything that comes to you is well deserving. Mm. Because you chose that road. So whether it be our children, whether it be our parents, grandparents, whatever it might be, as much as we love them, Yah is the judge of the earth. Uh -huh. And he's the one that's going to judge everything, everything that a person does. And he's going to bring it to judgment. And he's going to be the one who's going to determine whether or not that person gets another opportunity or they don't. So our best bet is to do what's right before this great king, to walk in the righteous path, and hope that the Most High God will have mercy upon us and God and protect us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How y'all feeling today? So, the Shabbat day is great. I know that we just coming off of Kog Matzot and it's like a it's like an extra day. Mm -hmm. We right in link with, with our Jewish counterparts. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it is a blessing. This period of time is, is a blessing for us. And we're thankful to God for this period of time. Because you get to, with, with the holy seasons, you get to reflect and, and um, think about, you know, the past year or the past season or the season that you're in. And you get to really reflect about life. This time is a, it's a beautiful time because it's a renewing. You know, you renew your spirit. You renew your body. Mm. It's a seven-day cycle, and we're thankful to God for that. We thank, we're thankful to the Creator for that because everybody doesn't get that. Mm. You know, everybody does not get that. I was, I was hearing um, um, Maury Yiftak and Chief Benyamin speak about preparation for for these holy seasons and how we should prepare and, and do things. Um, it's true, we have to be a little bit more prepared for certain things and, and be able to enjoy and, and have joy in these, in these times and these seasons because it's imperative. But I think that we're not too far from it. I think we're not too far from it. I, I believe that we have to be optimistic about the things that, that we want done and, and look at it in a positive way. So I thank the creator for this season once again. Let us start with the portion called Shemini, which is, um, we'll begin in the book of Leviticus, chapter 9, verse 1. Anybody know what Shemini means? Eighth. Eighth. Hallelujah. Let us go, my brother. We're in the book of Leviticus, the ninth chapter in the first verse. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moshe called Aharon and his sons, and the elders of Israel, and he said unto Aharon, Take thee a bull calf for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, without blemish, and offer them before Jehovah. And unto the children of Israel thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a he goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year, without blemish, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for peace offerings, to sacrifice before Jehovah. And the meal offering mingle with oil, for today Yehoah appeareth unto you. For today Yehoah appeareth unto you. So now, and it came to pass on the eighth day that Moshe called Aharon and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said unto them, Take thee a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering mm -hmm. with, with, without blemish right. and offer them before Yehoah. So Perfect. this is after... The tabernacle has been erected. Mm -hmm. This is after the priest has been given this order, the order for um, their clothing. Mm -hmm. This is after all these things. Now it's time for them to come to before the Most High God and atone for their sins and make sure that they get those sins up off them. Mm -hmm. So now there's certain particular offerings and, and sacrifices that they have to make before the Most High God before... They could sanctify the people, they have to sanctify themselves. They have to be clean before they could deem the people or make the people clean. Right. So these are the things that the priests, the high priest and his sons, they have to do. This is Aaron and his four sons at this time. Let us go. And they brought that which Moshe commanded before the tent of meeting. And all the congregation drew near and stood before Jehovah. And Moshe said, this is the thing which Jehovah commanded that ye should do, that the glory of Jehovah may appear unto you. And Moshe said unto Aharon, Draw near unto the altar, and offer thy sin offering, and thy burnt offering, and make atonement for thyself and for the people, and present the offering of the people, and make atonement for them as Jehovah commanded. So you see, they had to bring 
perfect animals before God. Right. They had to come before God with perfection. Mm -hmm. God didn't allow anything out of, out of sorts or out of his place. He wanted everything to be perfect, and Moses is pushing that line. He said, listen, when you come before God, come in your perfection. Right. Come in your righteousness. He's warning them. He's giving them that fair warning. Why? Because Moses understands because God almost took Moses out. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that. When Moses was leaving his father-in-law, mm -hmm. he was going to take him out because the boys hadn't been circumcised. Right. So Moses understands that the Most High God is not one to play with. Right here it says, this is the thing which Jehovah commanded that ye should do, that the glory of Jehovah may appear unto you. So God don't appear before you if you're not walking in that right path. We have to be in such, in such sync, in such perfection for God to appear before us. So that means, that's why it tells you, it says when, when, um, when, when the Most High God was going to appear to the children of Israel, it says make sure the man haven't gone near to a woman for three days. Make sure that you don't have no poop sitting around mm -hmm. in the midst of you. Right. Get a paddle and dig and dig up the earth and right. put that poop down there because God dwells in the midst of you right. and he don't dwell in the, in the midst of, of uncleanliness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you have these babies, make sure you take that, that poop pamper mm -hmm. and that poop garbage out the house mm -hmm. so that God could dwell in the midst of you. Mm. Baby poop, adult poop is still poop. Get it out the house. We used to practice things like that, right or wrong. Right. We used to do things like that. We used to take the diapers and all that stuff the, the, and get that stuff out the house because the Most High God does not dwell in the midst of that. And if you want God to dwell in the midst of you, you got to get the uncleanness out the midst of you. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is the God that we serve. Amen. Let us go. Verse 8. So Aharon drew near unto the altar and slew the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. Uh-huh, so he slew the calf of the sin offering, which was for, for, for himself. He got to, him being the high priest, he got to get himself straight first. Mm -hmm. Because that's the hierarchy. Let us go. And the sons of Aharon presented the blood unto him, and he dipped his finger in the blood, and put it upon the horns of the altar, and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. Mm -hmm. But the fat and the kidneys, and the lobe of the liver of the sin offering, he made smoke upon the altar, uh -huh. as Jehovah commanded. As Jehovah commanded. So he took every part of the sin offering and made a smoke on the altar. Now him putting the blood on the four horns of the altar, I don't have an explanation for that. Mm -hmm. Only God knows why he required Aaron to do this. Mm -hmm. Let us go. And the flesh and the skin were burnt with fire without the camp. Without the camp. So the flesh, it says... And the flesh and the skin were burnt with fire without the camp, outside of the tabernacle. Let us go. And he slew the burnt offering. Uh -huh. And Aharon's sons delivered unto him the blood. And he dashed it against the altar round about. And they delivered the burnt offering unto him, piece by piece, and the head. And he made them smoke upon the altar. This is all detail. Right. This is what we have to understand. God is very meticulous. Mm -hmm. Right? He's very detailed. He said... Splash the blood, what, around the altar, right? That's what he told them to do. He didn't tell them take the blood and dump it out in a, in a, in a place that they didn't know about. He said be specific. Right. Take this blood and splash it around the altar. This is what God asked for. He's specific. Anything outside of that order is us doing our own thing. Anything outside of that order is the priest and the high priest doing their own thing. And that's not what God is looking for. That's why we always say that our emotions has nothing to do with God. Because emotional people, a lot of them get hurt. No matter what type of emotion. It could be a, a, a joyful emotion. Mm -hmm. But if you overdo it or you, you overcross your boundaries, then that emotion could get you in trouble. So the Most High God is being specific. Moses was specific with his brother and his nephews as to what to do when it comes to these offerings. Let us go. Verse 14. Uh -huh. And he washed the inwards and the legs and made them smoke upon the burnt offering on the altar. Let's go. And the people's offering was presented, and he took the goat of the sin offering, which was for the people, uh -huh. and slew it and offered it for sin as the first. And he offered it for sin as the first. Now we're getting down to the people. Let's go. And the burnt offering was presented, and he offered it according to the ordinance. 
and the meal offering was presented, and he filled his hand therefrom and made it smoke upon the altar. Besides the burnt offering of the morning, uh -huh. he slew also the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings, which was for the people. And Aharon's son delivered unto him the blood, and he dashed it against the altar round about. Uh -huh. And the fat of the ox and of the ram, the fat tail, and that which covers the inwards, and the kidneys, and the lobe of the liver. And they put the fat upon the breast, and he made the fat smoke upon the altar. And the breast and the right thigh, Aharon waved for a wave offering before Jehovah, uh -huh. as Moshe commanded. As Moses commanded, let's go. And Aharon lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering, and the burnt offering, and the peace offering. So Aaron... He, he lifted up his hands and he, and he did the blessing mm -hmm. that we do after the end of every service. Right? That's what he did. Because everything was done according to the instruction that the Most High God gave Moses and he passed down to them as according to to the offerings that were supposed to go up before the Creator. Let us go. And Moshe and Aharon went into the tent of meeting and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of Yehovah appeared unto all the people. And there came forth fire from before Yehovah and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. That, that was approval by God. Right. When fire came from heaven and consumed all the offerings, mm -hmm. that means that God was well satisfied mm -hmm with what they did because it wasn't emotion emotion wasn't involved in that it was following the instructions that the most high god gave them right to do to the t so god approved fire came from heaven and approved of everything that was laid out there for an offering let us go chapter 10 hallelujah hallelujah and nadav and abihu the sons of aharon took each of them his censer and put fire therein and laid incense thereon, and offered strange fire before Yehovah, which he had not commanded them. God didn't command this. This is what I'm talking about, following instructions, right? Following instructions. Man. A coach could tell you, a coach could tell you, um, let's say you run, let, let's say you do track, right? A coach tells you, I need you to, to go and do, um, do three, two laps, right? The first lap, you're going to jog. The last lap, you're going to go all out. You know, then after that, you walk. But you said to yourself, man, I could go all out on all three laps. And you go all out all three laps. The coach is telling you because he understands that if you go all out all three laps, by the time you get to the actual race, right, no. that you're going to be worn out. Right. So the coach is actually giving you the instructions mm. on how to build your body mm -hmm. so that you could be at peak performance right. when that meet comes. Right. But if you say, no, I'm going to I'm I'm run extra, the coach said, no, that's not what I asked you for. What I asked you for, I didn't ask you for extra. What I told you is jog one, mm -hmm. go all out the second, and walk the third. That's what I asked you for. Sick. Oh, no, but I got this. By the time you get to the meet, your, the bottom of your feet are sore. Mm -hmm. You shot. Your body can can um you dehydrated mm -hmm. because every time the coach told you to go jog all out and walk, you ran it all out all three. Mm. This the same thing with God. Sometimes we shoot our own selves in the foot. God didn't ask us for a lot. Mm. He just asked us for a little. Mm -hmm. Follow the instructions, and when you follow the instructions. Most of the time, things happen in the way that you're supposed to, yeah. they're supposed to happen. Right. 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 But when we don't follow the instructions, then things begin to go opposite as to where the things were supposed to be. So if we stay on track and following instructions, then God will bless us. If we don't, then you know what? We, God blesses us, but it's already the blessing that's out there in the ether. Mm. It's already out there. All you got to do is reach out and grab it. Absolutely. But when you go opposite to, to that, there's a curse that's out there in the ether that you're going to grab. Mm -hmm. Let us go. Verse 2. Uh -huh. And there came forth fire from before Jehovah and devoured them, and they died before Jehovah. Then Moshe said unto Aharon, this is, that, this is it that Jehovah spoke, saying, 
Through them that are nigh unto me, uh -huh. I will be sanctified. To, by, by them that are nigh unto me, I will be sanctified. And before so, all the people, I will be glorified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. So God don't allow you that opportunity to make mistakes when you're standing in okay. that position okay, before the that. people. Talk about that. When you're standing in that position before the people, God will take it away from you, man. Sometimes it might not come as bad as Nadab and Abihu, but sometimes he make you lose your mind. Mm. And you don't even know you lost your mind. Nah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the Most High takes things away from you and you can't realize it till three years later because of your own stubbornness and your own volition. Mm. The own things that run through your mind. But this is the God that we deal with. God is not a play play God. When you're in a position of, of power, when you are a position of leadership, you have to be careful what you do with the people. Amen. When you are a shepherd, you got to understand what you do with the people. Amen. We got to be, as, as people that stand before God's people and teach, we have to be meek. We have to be humble. We have to understand that we're not perfect. We got to understand that we make mistakes. We have to understand that um, sometimes when we, when we teach, sometimes we stepping on our own toes. There was only one man that was recorded to be perfect. Mm -hmm. We strive for perfection, but it was only Abraham. That's why it said, look unto Abraham. Mm -hmm. so, teach it said, look unto Sarah. Yeah. Teach us. Said, look unto them because he's the example of perfection. He's the model. He's the role model. Because we, we are men and we sometimes we falter. But that's okay. You know why? Because we could pick ourselves back up again. And when we make mistakes and we stump our toes, there's a God that's merciful. So he allows us that opportunity to recover. And we got to be thankful for that. We got to say Toda Yeho for that. We got to be grateful to, for all the things, the good things that he does for us and the bad ones. Because like I said, through the bad ones, we learn. Mm -hmm. Experience. Mm -hmm. Experience. That's how you could tell the children, listen, don't go down that road. That's right. Because I already know what's coming behind know. that. Right, teach us. Sometimes they don't listen. But the ones that do listen, you save them from heartache and pain. Right, right, right. Heartache and pain. Let us go. And Aharon held his peace. And Aharon held his peace. Uh huh. And Moshe called Mishael and Elsaphon, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aharon, and said unto them, Draw near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. Uh -huh. So they drew near and carried them in their tunics out of the camp, as Moshe had said. You hear that? Huh. Fire, just like fire came from heaven to consume the offering to. to Come on. Mode Mishael. Ben Yisrael. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How you doing, Mode? Hallelujah. We got a seat for you up here, Mode. Shabbat Shalom. Elder in the midst of us, Moray Mishael, Ben Yisrael, the prominent Hebrew teacher in our community. Many of us have learned and Torah teacher, first and foremost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Any, any chair. Blessed be. May be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what we do. We do Torah. But we do Torah, it says we rise for the hoary head. Hallelujah. And we rise for our elders, and that's part of us doing the Torah of the Most High God. You know why? Because elders have put in their time. That's right. So when it says, whenever they appear before you, that you rise. Mm -hmm. You don't sit down and talk, hey, what's up, Moray? How you nah, doing? No, no, no. You got to show him that respect. You got to right. show that mother that respect. And whenever they walk into the room, we're supposed to, whatever we're doing, you stop it. Right. 
And you address that elder. Amen. That's what it's about. We give thanks to the Most High God for our elder. Moray Mishael is a testament of a man who put a trust, is trusting the Most High God. And no matter what adversities came before him. And I could talk about it because they was right before us. What adversity came before him, he trusted in the Most High and he's overcome them. That's right. And he's right here. And he's a testament. Mm -hmm. He's a testament to, to God's great work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're in the book of Leviticus chapter 10, verse 6. And Moshe said unto Aharon and unto Eleazar and unto Etamar, his sons, Let not the hair of your heads go loose, neither rent your clothes, that ye die not, and that he be not wroth with all the congregation. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, be well the burning which Jehovah hath kindled. Say, listen, the job must get completed. That's it. This is not, the job is not done. Now, some, some Bible critics say that Moses was callous. Mm. How can he act that way, seeing that his brother's in pain, his nephews just died. Right. Moses is just about the job. Mm. This is why he was loved by God. Because he was just about the job. He said, listen, don't take them turbans off your head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't start renting that, them holy garments that were just made for you. He said, continue with the job. The job has to be completed. This is what this is about. Let us right. go. Verse 7. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tent of meeting, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of Yehovah is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moshe. Because that anointing oil is on you. And they did according to what Moshe said, with a, with a heavy heart, but they had to complete the job. This shows that God does not, I repeat, God does not care about our emotions. Amen. We are emotional people. You can't take emotion away from us. But God is teaching us that we must control that emotion. Mm -hmm. Anger is an emotion. Doesn't it say that anger rests up in the bosom of a fool? Yes, sir. So when we get angry and we... Oh, man, you know, that's him. You know, when he, when he get angry, he fly off the handle. It doesn't mean that that's right. <laughs> right. Oh, when she gets angry, she flies off the handle. It doesn't mean that she's right. Your point could have been started out as you being right, but once you, you let that emotion come out of you, then you're done. So that's what I say. Sometimes our emotions make us do more than what we're supposed to do, either good or bad. Because we're going we gonna to read here that in their heart, they thought they were doing something good. Mm -hmm. But that, that joy and that overextension of, of what they felt was, was right before God cost them their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's not what God asked for. God said, do what I said do. That's it. <laughs> Can't put it no better than that. That's it. Exactly how I said to do it. That's it. Don't add to it, don't diminish from it. Don't, don't the Lord say that? Okay. Don't add to it, don't diminish from it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Let us go. And Yehovah spoke unto Aharon, saying, Drink no wine, nor strong drink thou, nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tent of meeting, that ye die not. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generation. We are people that drank wine. Mm -hmm. We wasn't the people that sat around you, drank wine, strong drink. We might drink us a cold one, but God said, when you coming before me, make sure that your mind is clear. Yeah. That's why we have a rule that if you see a brother and we might have a feast day or something like that, and a brother might take a drink or something, now nah, you don't say the prayer. We're going to get somebody, some of these non-drinkers over here, mm -hmm. some of these people that don't, or wherever we're at. Yeah. Even if it's not a holy day, if we just sitting around and you always got brothers that don't drink. Amen. You got them today, just like you had them back then. Now, you're going to say the prayer. Why? Because it's a respect to the holiness of the creator. Mm. It's a respect. And that's what we adopted and that's what we carry on because we don't want to come up short before the, this great king. That's right. We have to be right and exact when we come up before this great king. So it gives us maybe an insight of what Nadab and Abihu was doing. Maybe they was too happy. Mm -hmm. And maybe they got carried away. And they overextended what God asked of them. Let us go. And that you may put difference between the holy and the common, uh -huh. and between the unclean and the clean. You got to make a difference between the holy and the common. What's holy is holy, and what's common is common. 
That's why many of us, we got our garments for, for Shabbat and for holy days. Amen. You see, you make a, some people make a separation, right. right? Even if you wear culture seven days a week, some people say, these are my specific clothes for Shabbat. Some people right. do that. Because they look at it as being, this is for holiness, and this is for my common way. You make a separation between the common and the holy. That's why the Most High God told us, says, in six days he created the heavens and the earth, right? And then he told us, he said, on the sixth day, when we was out in the wilderness, he said, gather up twice as much. He told us, see that which you may see. He said, bake that which you shall bake. He said, because on the seventh day, you are not allowed to do that. Now, it doesn't mean we can't eat, but it's telling us we can't cook. We can't prepare anything. We can't do any of that. Why? Because the Shabbat day is the day of rest. Amen. That's a holy day. It's sanctified amongst all the other six days. Amen. This day is set aside from the beginning of time. Amen. Amen. God separated it. Make a difference between the common and the holy. You have to make a difference. Amen. Can't be the same. Can't be looked at as the same. Right. Let us go. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which Jehovah have spoken unto them by the hand of Moshe. Teach them all the statutes. This is why we reiterate the Torah every, every year. We go over the book, those first five books, every year. Some people say, oh, that's boring. Some people online might say, why they read that Hebrew? We don't understand it. Well, if you don't understand it in the language that our forefathers wrote it in, then when you get to a point of controversy, how would you ever be able to Look up a word in Hebrew if you don't understand the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You depending on someone's translation. Mm -hmm. Don't you know that King James made some, some bad translations here? <laughs> everything he did, I mean, they did a, a pretty good job, but everything they translated wasn't translated properly. Mm -hmm. Some things are in the past tense but it's not spoken about in the past tense. Why? Because he left it that way because he was trying to reach a certain agenda. He was trying to push a certain agenda across mm -hmm. to people because King James was a Christian. Mm. So he made it sound like it was speaking about some, some, some Christ that was coming in the future mm -hmm. when he translated it. Leave a word out here. Leave an uh, interpretation out there. Mm. And that's what they did. So when we go over the Torah every year, when we read out of, the, out of that Hebrew, don't get disenchanted and say, oh, you know how we got to read this. You know what you do? You learn. You learn your Aleph Bait. You learn how to put words together. You learn how to do certain things so that the Most High God will give you a better understanding of this book so that you could be able to teach your kids in a, in, in a better fashion. I was speaking, I remember I did the interview with Maury Mishael, and he was telling me, he said, when I first started, you know, he learned from Nasi Barak, but when he started, he said, by the time he went along and he got to, to his last son, he said his last son got the best out of him in the Hebrew because he never stopped, so he got better with time. Mm -hmm. So the more you study and the, and the more you apply yourself to learning something, the better you become. The better you become. You got, but first, you got to put yourself out there and you got to apply yourself in order to learn. Right. If you don't do that, if you, you can't just sit on the drums and think that you're going to just become good. No. Meku could teach you thum, 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 all day, but if you don't go home and practice, you're not going not, not to be good. Right. He could teach you, pa pa boop, pa pa boop. He could teach you that all day, and that's all you'll be doing. If you don't go home and practice, you're not going to become better. Let us go. Verse so 12. it is with the Torah. If you don't practice the Torah, you're not going to become better. If every time a test come before you and you don't practice, then you're not going to become better. Let's go. Verse 12. And Moshe spoke unto Aharon and unto Eleazar and unto Itamar, his sons that were left. Take the meal offering that remaineth of the offerings of your whole made by fire and eat it without leaven beside the altar, for it is most holy. Moses is about the job. Get on the job, finish the job. 
I'm scared. You should be scared too. Let's get this done. Let's go. And you shall eat it in the holy place because it is thy due and thy son's due of the orphans of your whole made by fire. Uh -huh. But so I am commanded. Uh-huh. Let's go. And the breast of waving and the thigh of heaving shall you eat in the clean place. Thou and thy sons and thy daughters with thee. But they are given as thy due and thy sons due out of the sacrifices of the peace offerings of the children of Israel. Of the children of Israel. Let's go. The thigh of heaving and the breast of waving shall they bring with the offerings of the fat made by fire to wave it for a wave offering before Yehoah. And it shall be thine and thy sons with thee as a do forever as Jehovah have Man, Moses is about that. He's about, he's focused. Right. He's focused about what they got to do. Look, this belongs to you. This is for you and your sons. This is for you and your family. This is what has to be burned. Let's get on it, Aaron. Mm -hmm. You didn't see what, hap what, what just happened? Oh, yeah. God is not satisfied with something that happened here. So let's get on the job because we don't want to lose because God will kill you oh, yeah. and will kill the, the, your other two sons. Right. And we'll get this going some other way. Because God has no respect. Yah has no respect of person. That's right. He has no respect of person. When Moses didn't sanctify the Most High God before the people, say, you're not going into the land. And Moses was, was declared the meekest man that ever lived. God said, because you didn't make that, because you didn't sanctify me, you didn't sanctify my name from yours, Say, so you're not going into the land. Now, you're going to get to see the land, but you won't go into that land. Mm. That's the God that we serve. Let us go. And Moshe diligently inquired for the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burnt. It was burnt. And he was angry with Eleazar and with uh -huh. Tamar, the sons of Aharon that were left, saying, Wherefore have he not eaten the sin offering in the place of the sanctuary, seeing it is most holy? And he hath given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before Yehovah. Moses is worried about why didn't you follow all the steps? Mm -hmm. The sin offering you're supposed to eat, Aaron. You're supposed to eat this. He's worried because he's like, look, something went wrong along the way. So let's get everything else right so that nothing else goes wrong. And let's see what Aaron says. Behold, the blood of it was not brought into the sanctu sanctuary within. You should certainly have eaten it in the sanctuary, as I commanded. As I commanded. And I have spoken to Moshe. Behold, this day have they offered their sin offering and their burnt offerings before Yehoah. And there have befallen me such things as these. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been well pleasing in the sight of Yehoah? Yeah, he said, if I, look, whether I ate this or not, would God be happy with me? So I'm, you know, when, when that happens, people can't eat. No. Your appetite is not up. Aaron, you know, Aaron, I can't imagine what it is to lose a child. Mm. I've never been there. But I, could, but I could only picture what a parent goes through and losing a child, right? And then having to still do your job. Uh -huh. How can you operate? Your mind is racing. All types of things is going through your mind. All types of, of crazy thoughts, oh, yeah. flashbacks, and oh, yeah. when this child and, and, yeah. and, and your brother's telling, screaming on you and telling you, get on the job. You got to finish the job. You got to finish the job. You can't. I don't have an appetite. Some people can't even sleep. Right. You won't sleep for days. You won't sleep for days. Lose weight, do all types of stuff. Mm -hmm. No, app, you don't have an appetite. Right. So he said, "Listen, God, would, would it, would it, you know, would God feel any way if I if I ate it or not?" He said, "I burnt it. I can't. You know, I'm I'm hurt right now, Moses." So that's why some of the Bible historians said Moses was callous. He didn't have any feelings. Not that Moses was callous. He was scared. He was scared. He was scared. Let us go. And when Moshe heard that, uh -huh. it was well pleasing in his sight. <laughs> and when Moses heard that, it was well pleasing in his sight. Now, the next chapter we go into, I had a, um, well, I have a teacher. He's still alive by the name of Chief Elazar. He was, he was a stickler for the dietary law. I mean, he was, when I came around, I mean, if you was eating anything that was remotely he felt like you was eating something unclean. I mean, he would let you know. Some people thought of him as being um, overbearing, 
or that it was too much. But I'll tell you what he did for us. He saved a lot of our lives. Mm. He saved a lot of our lives because it's as strong as he was about teaching that Torah and teaching about that dietary law, a lot of us got a lot of good out of it. Because he taught us how to eat. He taught us how to deal with the herbs. He taught us how to do all those things. That's right. He taught us how to be diligent when it came to maintaining our bodies and what we put into our bodies. Right. He was the one that was telling us about, you. we talk about alkaline, your water, put lemon in there. He was doing that 30 years ago. Everything that Dr. Sabi was talking about, he was doing it. Mm. Anybody run to Dr. Sabi? He was, Chief Elazar was doing that stuff. Curing cancer and doing all that stuff. He was doing all that stuff. Mm. For real, I'm not making this stuff up. I remember that man, he, he was trying, he was working on himself for something, and he would go by Lincoln Terrace Park and run 10 laps around Lincoln Terrace Park, go in the backyard, hit a, a heavy bag, and, and, and talking about, I got to starve this thing out of me. Mm. And he got it out. He got it out of him. He went to the doctor. The doctor told him, you no longer have that. Mm. So a lot of people, you know, when we as Israelites, when we look at ourselves and we look at what we consume, we don't pay attention to what we consume. We eat out of any and every place. You go to any greasy joint and say, because only, they only got chicken in there that is okay. Or you think they only got chicken in there. Or you're only getting the chicken out of there. We can't do that. I'm going to get me a burger from over here. I'm going to get me a, a, some fries from over there. But to everything, there's ingredients. You know that they put unclean animals in beer? Mm. In a beer that you drink. They put ingredients from an unclean animal in a beer that you drink. Mm, mm, mm. Do your research. Guinness stout. When they brew that stout, right, um, what happens is when it goes through the refining stage, the yeast that's in it, it comes bubbling up. So what they do is they use, they use the, the bladder or, the, or they use an ingredient called isinglass. Now, isinglass is from the bladder of a fish called a Chinese sturgeon. They put that in there so that the yeast will come down and so that the refining process will become better. If it's an unclean fish and it's going into your beer, right. your beer is unclean. Right. But we don't think about things that way. It's just a drink. It's just a juice. I remember there was a drink called, I don't even know if they sell it anymore, Clamato. They used to put clam juice in that. But it was a tomato juice, but they used to put clam juice in that. So we thinking it's a tomato juice, but you're really drinking clam. Mm. These are the things that we did. He's the one that told us that we shouldn't be eating out of Kentucky. We shouldn't be eating out of none of those places. And he used to be adamant about it. He used to be adamant about us eating out of these places. <clears throat> he used to tell us things like, one of these days, y'all going to be coming out of them places, and the Z-Lock going to be waiting for you. <laughs> Bust you right upside your head. You don't even know what's going to hit you. That's what he used to say. But he tried to put the fear of God in us because he understood that Israelites was loose when it came to eating. Mm. And we still are. So we look at somebody like we looked at somebody like him, or some people looked at somebody like him, and you frown. But in reality, he saved your life. And these are the people and the teachers and the people that you acknowledge that God put the wisdom in them in order to bring forth a message. Sometimes with Israelites, you can't come easy with Israelites, you know. Nah. Look at all the candies that we eat. Do you really do you really know the ingredients in, in uh in a peppermint ball? Have you ever seen an ingredient in a peppermint ball? Israelites eat that. 
Have you ever read Do the Peppermint Ball when you buy it from the store? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's when we was younger, it was like a nickel or something like that. Um, do they give? Do that little clear wrapper come with ingredients? No, sir. Mm. What about all the gummy bears and all the gummy stuff that we eat? Most of those gummy bears and gummy candies have gelatin in it. The base to make those candies is gelatin. Gelatin comes from animal, predominantly the pig. Mm. Now, they got gelatin that comes from fish. Like you got some marshmallows that show you that so-and-so-and-so -and -so come from gelatin from this fish. It will specify what fish, and then it's good for you to eat. But that regular gelatin that you see in Jell-O, mm. that's why we can't eat that Jell-O. Because it has that gelatin. That's what causes it to become Jell-O. Mm. You got to be careful what you put into your body. Right. Things as simple as that. You going out there, you eating all types of candy with all the different dyes and all types of stuff. Those are things that affect us. Right. We just got to be careful. All, and none of us are perfect. You know, because we fall, I fall victim just like you fall victim. I'm not perfect. I'm just teaching the lesson, but I have to tell you the truth. I have to tell you the truth. Them Boston baked beans and lemon heads and all that stuff, you're not supposed to be eating none of that stuff. Don't eat that stuff. What, what do you need that stuff for? Right now, they got so many alternatives. Right now, you could go to, the, to Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, and all that, and they got alternative stuff that you could eat that you sure don't got no animal byproducts in it. They got it, so there is no excuse. When you go to the corner store, you eat not. Do they still sell now, ladies? Mm -hmm. yeah. And jingles. I know they don't sell don't jingles sell no jingles more. more. <laughs> you got to be old school to know about jingles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now and ladies and all that stuff. And that's what we, man, I, you go to school early in the morning, your mother give you a dollar? Yeah. I said, <laughs> it was like a border system in school. Ten cents a patty. It was just like that. People who come with brown bags full with candy. Yeah. <laughs> Jolly ranches. Yeah, you start trading off. Look at some. <laughs> That's all because he's right. They do, you go in there, you get you some. Now, the, the jingles was like five cents. Now, uh -huh. ladies was like 15, 10, 10 cents. Cent, 10 cent. You know what I mean? Jolly ranches, <laughs> bazooka gum. And you go to school, man, you got your sugar rush. You ain't, you ain't even eat no breakfast. That was your breakfast. <laughs> But all that stuff that we was putting into our body, they only put that stuff in our communities. Mm. You don't go to Benson Hurts and see all that stuff in there. Hmm. They put that stuff to destroy us, just like they put drugs in our communities to destroy us. Teach us. Teach us. Destroy our babies. Because what, what it is is you get that quick sugar rush and then you get a, a downer. Mm. You start dragging just like a dope fiend. Yep. And that's what they did to us. So all that sugar, they put all the sugar in our cereals. All the cereals that we eat, we think cereal is just cereal. But you got to read the ingredients. That's right. That's right. Cereal is not just cereal. They got some cereal, they put marshmallow in it. You got to read what you're eating. <laughs> that, that, is, that never gets played out, reading what you're eating. That never gets played out. If you're an Israelite and you're going into a spot, you know what I mean? And, and you just eating, you go to, um, what's some of these spots that they got out here? These common spots. Yeah. <laughs> the Outback and, and Sonic and you go to Five Guys Burgers and you go to all these spots and you eat out of these spots. You don't know what you're eating. You don't. Let's be serious about it. I mean, sometimes I see people on on social media and they out, I'll be like, I wonder, I wonder where they went to. They like, oh, we at BBQs or BB Kings or whatever you call it. I don't even know the name of the spot. How the heck you eating from BB Kings? How you eating from BB Kings? Applebee's, how you eating from Applebee's? We never did that. You might as well go to Mickey D's and get you a burger. Ain't no 
a difference because it says BB BB Kings? BB mm. King. <laughs> and you eating wings from there? <laughs> you a savage. Savage. <laughs> you a savage. You eating you eating out of Manuel's um Spanish food restaurant, you eating pork. <laughs> <laughs> All they cook with is pork. Jesus, I know. Right. <laughs> All they cook with is pork. I don't care how much chicken they got in there. Believe you me, they got some pigtail in that rice. That's they right. season some stuff with some pig drippings. That's what they do. Teach our own. That's what that's what they do, man. They get that fat back and they fry it. That thing smell good. That's huh? <laughs> why so God said, burn the fat to me. Because fat smell good. Mm. Mm, but God right. said, don't eat it. And now we come to find out later that fat is no good for you. No. It, it raises your cholesterol. Right. So everything God was telling us was right and exact. Right. Mm. But we falter because we let our, our, and like I said, we let our nostrils lead us. Right. Oh, that smells so good. It's only chicken. You eat everything that they got in there. You go and you see, you look at the tray, right? Uh -huh. They got all types of stuff up there. You're like, oh, this buffet look nice. So the, the man is asking you, what you want to eat? So you like, oh, give me some of that chicken right there. Give me some of that rice. Give me some of that um, salad right there. And that, you're not doing, but he got kingfish right there. He got shrimps right over there. And he putting everything, all the spoons, he putting it in one little container. All the spoons is in there. The same spoon he pick up the shrimp, the kingfish, and everything else with. You go, he pick up your chicken and your rice. But you think you eating clean. Nah. You're not eating clean. Pork juice. That's what you eating. You eat some more shrimp juice. Yeah. And those of you that come out of that world, oh, you know shrimp tastes good. <laughs> But we can't eat it. Can't eat it. Crabs. All types of stuff. Let us go, because I could talk about that <laughs> off the top of my head all day. Let's go into the Lord. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 11, verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Yehovah spoke unto Moshe and to Aharon, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, these are the living things which he may eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Uh -huh. Whatsoever part of the hoof and is wholly cloven footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, these may ye eat. Uh huh. Whatsoever part of the hoof. Mm -hmm. It says right here. Um, so to part the hoof, the animals have a, a hard um, toenail type of horn that they got at the bottom of the of their feet, right? Mm -hmm. That hoof or that nail has to be split completely down, down the middle, right? And cloven-footed is? Cloven-footed animals have a complete split in their hooves. Uh -huh. These hooves are called claws and are named for their relative location on the foot. Uh -huh. The outer or lateral claw or the inner or medial claw. Mm -hmm. the, primary, the primary difference between the room and... You want to go into that already? So right here, this is basically what it's showing you. This is like... This is the, the foot of, of some deer, or the feet of some deer, right there. This is being cloven-footed and the split in the hoof. Let us go, primary difference. The primary difference between a ruminant and non-ruminant called monogastrics, uh -huh. such as humans, dogs, and pigs, is that ruminants have a four-compartment stomach. The four parts of the stomach are the rumen, the reticulum, omasum, and abomasum. So an uh, animal that chews the cud it's not just an animal that eats grass. Because when a dog is sick, he eats grass. It's not just an animal that's, that eats grass. That's not chewing the cud. Chewing the cud is an animal that has a four-section stomach. Mm -hmm. These animals are like bovines, which is the cow, bulls, and animals like this. You got like um, from the flock, you got the goats, the, you got the sheep, you got these type of animals, they have four section stomachs. And then those four section stomachs, there's a process because they stomachs don't have that gastric acid that 
that at like um like us like humans have in our stomach. So that gastric, they have a four section stomach. We have a a, a monogastric system, mm -hmm. which means that we only got one stomach. We got a small intestine and a large intestine. These animals they have to go through a process. So chewing the cud is actually when they eat this this grass or, or grain or whatever it is that they eat, they 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 stomachs or their body have to go through this process to break down everything, bring it back up, bring it down, bring it back up, regurgitate it, bring it down again, and it goes through this process until it goes through all four sections of the stomach. That's actually chewing the cud, not just eating grass. Read, keep reading. In the first two chambers, the rumen and the reticulum, the food is mixed with saliva and separates into layers of solid and liquid material. Solid clumps together to form the cud or bolus. The cut is then regurgitated and chewed to completely mix it with saliva and to break down the particle size. Fiber, especially cellulose and hemicellulose, is primarily broken down in these chambers by microbes, mostly bacteria as well as some protozoa, fungi, and yeast into the three volatile fatty acids. So a lot of this stuff is just technical, but basically what it means is their bodies don't produce certain acids to break down. Um, some of these cellulose, so they have to go through this process, you know, so it's, it's, it's much more intricate than just eating grass, but it's actually a process that go through a body and the sections of their stomach that this, that this actual food has to go through for them to become an animal that chews the cut, not just eating grass, mm -hmm. all right? And like the pig, let us go read the Torah. Verse 4, uh -huh. nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that only chew the cud or of them that only part the hoof. The camel, because he cheweth the cud, but parteth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. The camel is unclean unto us. Let's go. And the rock badger, because he cheweth the cud, but parteth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. The rock badger, or oh, I believe he's called a hyrax. Mm -hmm. He's unclean unto you. Let's go. And the hare, because she cheweth the cud, but parteth not the hoof, she is unclean unto you. That's the rabbit or the rabbit family. Mm -hmm. We can't eat none of that stuff. We come from people that eat all this stuff. Right. You know, they eat rabbit. They walk around with rabbit's foots as good luck. You know, you knew people that walked around with rabbit's foots with, as good luck, charms. They eat rabbits. They eat raccoons. They eat possums. Mm. Squirrel. Squirrel. Name them. Y'all know. Snakes. They <laughs> eat everything. Iguanas. Everything. Listen, I was doing some research, right? And then I was looking at, at marsupi marsupials, right? Now, marsupials are predominantly in Australia. Mm -hmm. That's like the kangaroo, the wallaby, the, um, the koala bear. These are marsupials. So marsupials are animals that basically don't go through the gestation per um, like they like their bodies don't create that placenta. So the babies, when they're created, the gestation period, they go outside of the woman's, they crawl out of the, the mother's womb, and they feed in a pouch. Mm. So kangaroos, when you see them, they, they don't go through that, that gestation period in the, in the placenta, I believe it's called, right? So they, they crawl out of their mother's womb, and then they feed in the pouch. Mm. The little tiny things like this. Little tiny things. So these are marsupials. We can't eat any of those animals. And then in my research, I was like, they said the possum is a marsupial. I didn't know that. Mm. You know, but he looked like a rat. But he's a marsupial. Mm. You know, and seventy percent of them are in Australia. You got another twenty-eight percent in South America. The saber-toothed tiger was a marsupial. <laughs> You want to talk about that now? Nah, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, and two percent of them are in North America. That's a long discussion right there. <laughs> so yes, you know, you got different types of animals that we could eat and we cannot eat. You know, as we go down and we scroll down, it's going to speak about it and it's going to talk about it. Um, we have to be careful with all the things that we put into our bodies. Um, when I was doing research, when we talk about cheese, right, to the people online under the descriptions, there's, there's like, I put about four links 
to places you could go to about the liquor that you drink um, that's clean, cheeses, and stuff like that. With cheese, there's this thing called rennet mm -hmm. that they put in cheese. Now, the rennet could be from, from vegetable or microbacterial source, or it could be from an animal. So now, you have to find out. Now, I got a list up there. I didn't make the list. Y'all could do your own research. And I gave you a list of all the cheeses that are good, right? So you look, you look at them. You see the ones that they deal just with the vegetable or the microbacterial. But the one with the animals is iffy because we look at it like, well, if it's from an animal, it has to be from the cow. Companies don't do that. Mm. They don't do things like that. They don't think that way. They... This place manufactures the rennet, so we buy the rennet from this place. Although this is cow's milk, we'll bring pig rennet to make a cheese. Like when you, like when you look at, 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 for example, you look at a cheese like Borden's American Slices. Don't just look at cheese and say it's cheese. And this is what I'm talking about. You go to some of these spots and you get a cheeseburger, a burger joint. They could be using boarding American slices. Boarding American pasteurized slices has gelatin in it. You don't know what they're using because you're not asking them. You're just saying that's a cheeseburger. And I'm going to eat it because it's only cheese and it's, only, and it's beef. But you don't know what you're eating. Mm. This is why I said it gets very technical. The best place to eat really is at home. That's right. Your, your wife or you, or as a man, you cook, food goes to waste, you'd rather go outside. You don't know what it is that they're feeding you outside, especially when you go to these common joints. You go to these common joints, you don't know what you're eating. You don't know what you're eating. You look at a salad, you think the salad is, is straight, and they got muscle in there. Yeah. Mm. Calamari and all types of stuff in there. Clean. Clean. You go in there, you say, could nothing be wrong with this salad? It's a salad. <laughs> <laughs> so what's these little white things that, that's in the salad? Eat your muscle. Mm. And y'all know I'm telling the truth. We got to be careful with the fish that we eat. Yeah. Every fish is not straight. That's right. Let us read, my brother. Verse 7. And the swine, because he parteth, not the, he parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, but cheweth not the cud, he, got he a is mono, unclean unto you. He has a monogastric system, right. just like humans. Mm -hmm. He produces that acid. The swine is the sanitation department of the earth. Right. He eats anything. He eats everything. That's what swine do. They clean up. They clean up the earth. That's right. We got to be careful what we put into our bodies. Let us go. Of their flesh ye shall not eat, and their carcasses ye shall not touch. They are unclean unto you. You shall not eat their flesh, and you shall not touch their carcasses. They are unclean unto you. Mm -hmm. Our people ate, was raised up on pigs. Pig intestines, pig ears, hog head cheese, um, pig feet, pig tail, pig ribs. We use every part of that pig. That's what that slave master fed us. So we made use of every part of it. Some people said if they could have bottled the oink and sold it, they would have did that too. <laughs> We used every part of that pig. <laughs> we ate it. That's what they gave us. We are people that our bodies was used to. Our body is not even used to that heavy um, cow meat. That's the Europeans. Our body is used to the goat and the lamb. The goat, the sheep. That's what our body is used to. That's what our body broke down. When we when 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 we came when we came to the shores to this western hemisphere, right? And the slave master saw it, right? He saw us and he had to go back to to to, to Africa 
to go get the okra yeah. to come feed us because yeah. yeah. we wouldn't eat. Yeah. We wouldn't eat. Yeah. These are all things that's, that's, that's out there that our body work, work with. Yeah. These are things that are healing to us. Exactly. These are things that are healing to us. Why you think that, why you think that unleavened bread does, does that to you? Mm. First, your body has to go through the flushing, but eat unleavened bread the whole year. That's not going to be what happens to your body through the whole year. No, no. Your body will eventually readapt to what is for it. Because exactly. every bread that we made wasn't with leavening. Because no. having bread with leavening was a process. That's right. That wasn't something that you just bought a packet of yeast and threw it in the bread and then no. and you knead the dough and watch it rise. It wasn't like that. You had to let dough sour. Yeah. You had to let it sit, and you had to do it right, because you could you could spoil that. So you, it was a process. So every day it wasn't leavened bread that you ate. Sometimes you ate unleavened bread. That's where the concept of the whole flatbread come from, because the flatbread was made on leaven. They rolled it out. They they um cooked it on both sides. And they put your grain or whatever on top of it, and that's what you ate. That's where that whole rap thing come from. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't that all the time you had a loaf of leavened bread. It wasn't like no, that. No. So our bodies was used to that on leavened bread. Mm. All the diglycerides, mm. all of the, all of the, 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 um, the theorates, yeah. all of all these preservatives and all these things that they put in your food yeah. is no good. Sugar. He said, ooze, what you gonna sugar come from beets? It comes from sugar cane. It comes from this, it comes from that. Let me tell you something about sugar, especially that domino sugar. In order to process the sugar for it to become white and crystal like, they get bone chars. Or they use bone chars from cows. They use cows. But this is the cows that they get them. This is the cows that they get. Cows from India. Now in India, they worship the cow. Yeah. They don't eat the cow. No. So they get that, the bones of the cows that die of themselves. Yeah. So now, when we keep reading this law right here, it's going to tell us mm -hmm. even an animal that's clean, that die of itself, yeah. he right. becomes unclean to you, and you touching his carcass makes you unclean. Right. Domino sugar uses those same bones of yeah. them animals that die of themselves to, to, to filter their sugar. So if there's bone particles in your sugar and it has touched that unclean bone of that animal that died of itself, then you perhaps might be eating something unclean. That's how deep it goes. But there is alternate stuff out there. I put a link on the, on the, the descriptions where you can see the sugars that don't go through that process. I didn't have time to go read through all of this. When we done here, you just go to the, to the link. You go to, to our stream, and underneath there, there's links to all of this. There's, there's alternatives. There's different oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. sugars that you can use. That's right. That white sugar is not really good for us. No. That processed sugar is really not good for us. Our body can't, can't digest it properly. You know, Our forefathers, they use juices and stuff like that to sweeten. They use honey yeah. to sweeten. Yeah. They use dates. They use natural sweetness in order to sweeten whatever it is that they needed to sweeten. But that process, listen, that sugar made Europeans go crazy. When they brought us over here, it was to work in them sugar fields. All in Jamaica, Santo Domingo, Haiti. That's what we was doing. We was, the, the natives was dying out. They said, we need a people that could work in this sun. Mm -hmm. So they brought us over from over there and said, y'all work these fields. The sugar field. Europe became addicted to sugar, yeah. and they still addicted to sugar to this day. It made us addicted to it. I got a mean sweet. Listen, I said, you step on your own toes, right? I got a mean sweet tooth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And sugar is what, and you can see it, sugar is what puts <laughs> weight on you. That's right, because what happens is the body, and I'm, and I'm being truthful, the body stores, stores it as fat. 
A body stores it as fat. That's why they tell you, you, got to, you want to lose weight, cut down your sugar content. Because the body stores it as fat. And then if you're not exercising and you're not diligent with your exercise and you're not doing the right exercise to burn it off, it's going to build up in your body. But someone who's exercising like crazy, like a, or a professional swimmer or somebody who competes or people like this, they burn that stuff off. They burn the carbs off because sugar becomes carb in your system. Carbohydrates. Let's go. Verse 9. These may he eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, that may he eat. Uh-huh. You can't eat no pulpo, no, octopus, shark. shark, pulpo is octopus. octopus. You can't eat no um, kingfish, kingfish mackerel. Listen, with the tuna, with the tuna, this is what's going on with the tuna. With the tuna, a lot of people say, oh, the tuna has scales. Now, if you've seen that fish come out, and they sell it at the market, and they got fins and they got scales and they call it tuna, it's fine for you to eat. But that stuff in the can that they call tuna, you better not eat it. Because tuna are different species of fish. Some got it, some don't. You don't know the one that they have. As Israelites, I don't remember us eating tuna. I don't remember, I don't, I don't remember, at least the school that I came from, we didn't eat tuna. You know what I mean? We ate salmon. We ate stuff like that, but we never ate mackerel. My teachers taught us about kingfish. We couldn't eat that. We used to, we used to go to a, to a, to a place, to a place down on Notion. They used to make fish in the pocket. They used to use the whiting. And Chief Elazar went down there one day. He came back to the camp. We was on Notion. We was on St. John's and Notion upstairs. Say, y'all monkeys, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> so he used to call us monkeys. <laughs> y'all keep going down to that. You eat kingfish juice. Because they was cooking kingfish. And we thought because they was Muslims that they was halal, that they was okay. Muslims eat kingfish. And shrimp. They eat shrimps. So don't come to me talking about it's halal, brother. We can eat from there. I don't care about halal. Because God didn't tell us to eat halal. He told us to eat clean. He didn't tell us to eat halal. He didn't even tell us to eat kosher. Because the Jewish men eat duck. We don't eat duck. Okay, teach us. God told us to eat clean. He didn't tell us kosher. He told us clean. So, when we say kosher, the Jewish man eat duck. Yeah. What do you eat? This is, I'm not, don't get mad with me. Don't get mad. I'm just teaching you what the law says. Let us go so we could get through the animals, man. Verse 10. Uh huh. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers and all, the, all that swarm in the waters, and of all the living creatures that are in the waters, they are a detestable thing unto you. Uh -huh. They shall be a detestable thing unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh and their carcasses. You shall have them in detestation. Uh -huh. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that is a detestable thing unto you. It's a detestable thing unto you. Them amphibious animals. Right. We can't eat them animals. No. Frogs. People, man, you eat frog legs. People eat frog legs, man. That slimy animal, that nasty animal, they eat that. Mm -hmm. People eat lizards. Yeah. They eat all types of stuff. And everything tastes like chicken. <laughs> they go in the swamp and, and the gator's not bothering you. Go hunt gators and talk about it tastes like chicken. Gator is not bothering you. The gator is there to do his job. You come close enough to that river bank, he's going to pull you in. That's his job. But people go hunt them and eat them. 
We cannot eat these things. Let us go. And these shall ye have in detestation among the fowls. Uh -huh. They shall not be eaten. They are the detestable thing, uh -huh. the great vulture, and uh -huh. the bearded vulture, and the offspring, and the kite, and the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind, and the ostrich, and the nighthawk, and the sea mule, and the hawk after its kind, and the little owl, and the cormorant, and the great owl, and the horn owl, and the pelican, and the carrion vulture, and the stork, and the heron after its kind, and the hoopoe, and the bat. And the bat. So when we... These lists of, of birds, I'm going to put up the link to where you could download who they are and pictures of them. In fact, as an assignment to everybody online and everyone here, look up the birds. I mean, I go through this every year. I usually give you the description of how the bird look. But most of these vultures, they eat carrion, which is, which is dead animal, right? So they eat, they clean up the earth. The, the roadkill, you know, stuff that dies in the, in the jungle or stuff that dies in... Most continents have vultures, yes. Yes. have some sort of vulture because you need something to clean up the earth I mean. besides the pigs and everything and all the other animals that clean up the earth. The so you, got, you need the vultures. You got, you got owls. Yeah. These are um, birds. Of, owl is like a bird of prey, mm -hmm. right? The eagle, the hawk, these yeah. are all birds of prey. They like, they fresh, they fresh kill. They kill it themselves. Yeah. I seen an eagle up on a rock. Humans was going up there on a tour and they thought it was sweet. Mm. He was trying to grab one of those humans and throw them off the, the cliff of the rock. Yes. <laughs> they grabbed goats and, and mountain, mountain goats. Grab them. Physically grab them and drop them. Then go down and eat them. That's what they do. So God put these things, leave them alone. When they're in their habitat, don't go up there into the mountains and think it's sweet. Oh, we're going to go see the eagle's nest. You don't want to go see that eagle's nest. <laughs> Talking about you're going to go see the eagle's nest. I remember Prospect Park. They had a problem with rodents, right? So they brought all the red-tailed hawks in. We know, who could, we know the, the ones that could clean this up. So they brought them in. Red-tailed hawks. Did a beautiful job. Cleaned up all the rodents. Yeah. Now ain't nothing else to eat. So now you got your little toy dog running around off the leash. Guess what that red-tailed hawk gonna eat? Your dog. <laughs> started grabbing up people's dogs and stuff like that. They started. But then what happened is some escaped. Some didn't just stay in the park. They started going into the outskirts. So now you see hawks all through Brooklyn. Cleaning up pigeons. They, they, cause they're great hunters. They cleaning up everything, seagulls, everything. You see them come down sometime, boom, and they, they there. They cause mayhem. That's what they do. On the, on, on the Jersey Turnpike, I drive up and down the Jersey Turnpike. You see them on the light post, and you won't see no other birds no. out there. <laughs> you won't see any other bird out there. You might see a pack of geese or something like that fly. Because they that might be a little bit out they, they caliber, but if they hungry, they're going to go for it. Yeah. If they hungry. And they'll hunt you in the air. Mm. Yeah. Eagles and, and hawks, they'll hunt you up there. You see them sometimes, you see little birds trying to get away, and that hawk is just like this. <laughs> <laughs> He's not even flapping. That little bird fighting for his life. <laughs> the hawk is just... Yeah. That's what they built for, hunting. <laughs> They got some people that use them to hunt rabbits. Yeah. They train them and they hunt rabbits. And they go hunt like little game and stuff like that. That's what they do, squirrels and stuff like that. But we can't eat that stuff. Let us go. All wing swarming things that go up upon all fours are a detestable thing unto you. Verse 21. Yet these may ye eat of all wing swarming things that go up upon all fours, which have jointed legs above their feet, wherewith to leap upon the earth. Even these of them ye may eat, the locust after its kind, uh -huh. and the bald locust after its kind, and the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. But all winged swarming things which have four feet are a detestable thing. So the locust, the cricket, these are clean for us to eat. We don't come from a society where we eat these things. For, from what I read, they are a great source of protein. Yeah. Mm. And in the East, they eat these things. Yeah. We've been Americanized. We've been Westernized, so we, we're out of this. Right. Our forefathers being in the wilderness, they ate these things. Yeah. Mm. Fried it up. However they ate it, they ate it. 
But it was a great source of protein. It is a great source of protein. But the roaches and all these things that invade our homes, that's why we got to keep a clean home. Mm. That's, right. that's why we got to keep a clean home. Because these things invade our spaces. And we have to keep it all clean so that these things don't start dying in your cereal. Mm. They don't start dying in your food, in your, in your containers, in your boxes of food. Because we live amongst people that are not clean. So at least we have to be clean. So that's why when you argue with the children and you tell them, wash the dishes, clean up the kitchen, don't leave stuff by your bed. They leave plates, bowls, cups, all types of stuff. This stuff attracts these things. You sleep, you sleeping with, with all these things. I always tell the story. I learned my lesson when a roach got in my ear. Yeah. That thing got in my ear and it started crawling in there. And I was like, what's going on? Got up in the middle of the night. I said, something. Oh, my, my ear is hurting me. <laughs> but I felt every now and then I felt something like. Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> the rock's rock getting it. That was the worst pain mm. that I ever had. It was right by the eardrum. So when they took me to the doctor, emergency room, the doctor looked at me and was like, yeah, you like keeping a, 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 a filthy room, huh? Because <laughs> you, you got to kill it in your ear first. <laughs> kill it in your ear. They, you they drop whatever drops in there. <laughs> kill it in your ear. Then they got to flush your ear out. Mm. And you see the little pieces, the roach leg and all that stuff rolling down your face. Learn your lesson. But we're supposed to keep a clean space. Right. We're supposed to keep a clean space. Let us go. Verse 24. And by these ye shall become unclean. Whosoever toucheth the carcass of them shall be unclean until the even. And whosoever bear aught of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. Mm -hmm. Every beast which part of the hoof, but is not cloven footed, nor true of the cut, is unclean unto you. Uh -huh. Everyone that touches them shall be unclean. You shall be unclean. And whatsoever goeth upon its paws, among all beasts that go on all fours, they are unclean unto you. Uh -huh. Whoso touches their carcass shall be unclean unto the even. Dogs. That's why when you go into them Chinese restaurants, you don't know what you're eating. Cats. They eat that. I mean, we used to say it. And we didn't have really no pictures and stuff, but now they got video yeah. Yeah. where they got rows of dog skin. Yeah. Yeah. They got video with, they got cages yeah. of rats. rats and cats. Yeah. Cages, cage. Yeah. The they grabbed a live rat, knock it out, boom. <laughs> That's what they did, bop, just grab it, knock it out, sh 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 flay it. <laughs> Onions, peppers, Onions, peppers <laughs> spices. <laughs> Tastes just like chicken. <laughs> Some rice. <laughs> Some rice. <laughs> and we eating out of dumb joints? Mm. I seen an Israelite online talk about, um, yeah, I miss the fried chicken. Ain't nothing like the fried um, chicken wings from the Chinese restaurants in New York City. I'm like, what? So that's an Israelite? So what kind of Israelite is that? Uh, I, he said from a Chinese restaurant in New York City. Come on, man. I thought we'd been graduated from that. Mac, he said from a Chinese restaurant in New York City. Unbelievable. Let us go. And he that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. Uh -huh. They are unclean unto you. They are unclean unto you. Let us go. And these are they which are unclean unto you among the swarming things that swarm upon the earth. The weasel, and the mouse, and the great lizard after its kind, and the gecko, and the land crocodile, and the lizard, and the sand lizard, and the chameleon. People eat all these things. Don't be fooled. People eat all of these things. Let us go. These are they which are unclean unto you, unclean to you among all that swarm. Whosoever doth touch them when they are dead shall be unclean until the even. Say so they swarm. That means they come in great. Like when you live in a tropical area, mm -hmm. a lot of the tropical areas you won't see like a lot of roaches because you got lizards, and the lizards eat the roaches. 
But they will be, the lizards will live in your house like the roaches. So you wake up in the morning, there'll be a lizard on your bed. Mm. There'll be a lizard running around in your kitchen. But you get used to it because this is the environment you live in. You got actual little lizards running around in your house. You see them run up on the wall. They run up little places and, and into crevices, and that's what they do. You, if, 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 the, if the place gets flooded enough or there's enough rain, then the bullfrogs come out. The frogs come out. And the frogs be by your door. If you don't have, if you don't have enough a screen or protection in your house, the frogs will be in your house. Mm. Wake up, rabbit, <laughs> rabbit. And that's how most most of the kids that grow up in those places, we was cruel to animals. We would grab frogs and put firecrackers in their mouth, blow them up. We would do. We was cruel to animals. We was just cruel to animals. But you learned how to handle. You wasn't afraid of what they call the, um, the wild or nature or anything like that. You would just grab a bird. You would grab a, a bullfrog. You would grab a lizard. You weren't afraid of it because you were, you were brought up in that environment. You were brought up in that environment, so you learned how to deal with it. Remember one time we caught a sloth, and we was in Panama. We caught a sloth. Yeah, you, you, you know what a, a sloth is? <laughs> Those things, we caught one and we bludgeoned that thing to death. We was cruel to animals. <laughs> May God forgive us for all the things that we did. I can remember some episodes, man. We didn't, you were just cruel to animals. We was cruel to animals. Let us go. Verse 32. And upon whatsoever any of them, when they are dead, doth fall, it shall be unclean. It shall be unclean. Whether it be in any vessel of wood or raiment or skin or sack, whatsoever vessel it be, wherewith any work is done, it must be put into water, and it shall be unclean unto the even. Then shall it be clean. That's why we, you, you got to clean out your closet. Mm -hmm. You got to get that stuff. You got to cover up them little holes because them little critters come in, them, them mouse, mice come in. That those mouse droppings affect your breathing. The, the mouse urine affects your breathing. Then you wonder why the children got asthma because all that stuff, the, the, the roaches, the, the roach droppings and stuff like that because you don't keep a clean house. You have to keep a clean house. If you don't keep a clean house, then these things will begin to affect our health because mm -hmm. we're not supposed to be sharing spaces with them. The mice are field animals. Those are field animals. Those are not animals that belong in the house. They belong in the field. Mm -hmm. Rats don't belong in, if you got rats in your house, you got a problem. You got a problem. You got a problem that you got to take care of real quick. Because you got some, some of these New York City rats, the cats, the alley cats run away from them. You got the alley cats run away from you. Usually the alley cats in New York City are pretty good. But when you got some, some beasts out there, mm -hmm. Jurassic Park rats, and they'll battle. They'll do battle before you take them out. Let's go. And every earthen vessel we're into, any of them falleth. Whatsoever is in it shall be unclean, and, and it ye shall break. And it ye shall break. I remember one time we was at a gas station, and there was a... Indian guy in the BP, it was like, it was like the break of dawn. We was getting gas. It was me and Prince Poor. And the guy, the Indian guy, the rats was all around him and he was throwing like breadcrumbs to them. I was like, but then I, I had to do research on that. They, they worship the rat. They say that their ancestors come back in the form of a rat. But in India, got some of the higher cases of malaria and all the, 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 the rodent um, past diseases that you could think of, but they don't have enough sense to get rid of the rats. They just live around rats. They got a shrine for it. The rats is crawling all on them. This guy was actually feeding rats. 
That's why God told us to separate ourselves from these people and that we should have a different way of, of carrying ourselves than these people because these people do what they want to do mm -hmm. and they eat how they want to eat. We were supposed to teach the word. Let us go. All food therein which may be eaten, that on which water cometh shall be unclean. Uh -huh. And all drink and every such vessel that may be drunk shall be unclean. Uh -huh. And everything whereupon any part of their carcass for them shall be unclean. Uh -huh. Whether oven or range for pots, it shall be broken in pieces. They are unclean and shall be unclean unto you. Well, today we got metal ovens and, and metal pots, but back then they had them of clay. Mm -hmm. So you had to be very careful as to how you kept up your, your house. You had to be your tent, wherever you stayed, it had to be clean. Mm -hmm. Because you, you don't want to keep building a, a new oven. You don't want to keep building, um, getting new pots. These were all um, earthen vessels. Today we got metal, we could scorch it, we could clean off the, our, our stove tops and stuff like that. But, you know, when you go in and you, and you pour some rice or you pour some, and some stuff falls, clean it up. That's how you keep these things out. If you're an adult and you drop stuff on the stove, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, you nasty. You're supposed to clean up. Don't wait for your wife to come home and then oh, you got all the, the gravy drippings and everything all over. Clean up. Clean up. That prevents them from coming in. Let us go. Nevertheless, a fountain or a cistern wherein is a gathering of water shall be clean. But he who toucheth their carcass shall be unclean. Mm -hmm. And if all of their carcass fall upon any sowing seed which is to be sown, it is clean. So if, so if their carcass fall in a body of water, moving, living waters, then the water, it don't make the, it don't make the whole body of water right. unclean. And the lake and the river, stuff like that. You know, you're going to find dead animals in it, but doesn't make that, that whole body of, of water Unclean. Let us go. But if water be put upon the seed and all of their carcass fall therein, it is unclean unto you. So yeah, if you have a seed, if the seed is dry and the carcass of one of these unclean animals fall on it, the seed is still good. But once water touches that seed, then that seed becomes unclean because it begins to breathe. Mm -hmm. It begins to open up. Let us go. And if any beast of which ye meet may eat die, he that toucheth the carcass thereof shall be unclean unto the See, even. Any animal that and if any beast of which ye may eat. Die. He that toucheth the carcass thereof shall be unclean until the evening. Let's go. And he that eateth of the carcass of it shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. That's what I was saying about the cow with the, with the process, with the bone chart. These are cows that die of themselves. They become unclean unto us. Let's go. He also that beareth the carcass of it shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Uh-huh. And every swarming thing that swarmeth upon the earth is a detestable thing. Detestable it thing. It shall not be eaten. Uh -huh. Whatsoever goeth upon the belly, and whatsoever goeth upon all fours, or whatsoever have many feet, even all swarming things that swarm, swarm upon the earth, then ye shall not eat, for they are detestable things. Cayman. Ye the shall not crocodile. Make your, Let's go. Ye shall not make yourselves detestable with any swarming thing that swarming. Neither shall ye make yourselves unclean with them, that ye should be defiled thereby. Uh -huh. Don't be defiled by them. Let's go. For I am your holy, your God. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. Be ye holy. For I am holy. For I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any man of swarming thing that moveth upon the earth. For I am your holy that brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. To be you your shall God. shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So I brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Mm -hmm. So be holy. Mm -hmm. That's all the stuff we, you was doing back then. I brought you out of this so you could be sanctified and holy. Finish it out, my brother. This is the law of the beast and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and of every creature that swims upon the earth to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the living thing that may be eaten and the living thing that may not be eaten. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No other book has laws and regulations like these. The Muslims have to look into our book to get a dietary law. That's right. And now a Torah don't tell us that if you out there and it's necessary and you starving, that go ahead and eat the pork. Nah. Their book tell them that. If you're to the point of dying and starvation, that you eat enough just to make yourself full enough, right. but don't overeat. Our book don't tell us that. Nah. So we thank the creator of heaven and earth for this day. Thank you the most high God for the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that he has granted us all. Right. And remember... When you bring when I when we bring these lessons, it 
not only speaking to the audience, but it's also speaking to us because we're not perfect. Hallelujah. I've roamed this whole world over. I've been immersed in sin and shame. No man's feet I've not been under. What's my name? I've been chained with debate, slavery. My only thing, even my soul, nations plunder. What's my name? What's my name? Who could care? What's oh, none done stand with me? I alone have to be. the way the heathen use his name then he'll tear my bonds asunder then you hear when I
ra pa ra 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 pa ra 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 pa ra 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 pa ra pa ra 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 pa ra 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 pa ra 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 pa ra pa ra 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 Kill the old lamb. 
hakolasa ya febe ito gamed haolam na tan biliba mibli asher lo yim sa ha 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 he ha 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 se asher an sa ha he If you want peace, say shalom. I said, if you want peace, say shalom. I said, if you want peace, say shalom. Lo ye la kalo hima kerima pana hima temro si shalom. Kabere la bika we eri mecha hima temro si shalom. Kodesh Yom Hashabbat, Kodesh Yisrael, Imatem Rosim Shalom, 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 Shalom. Lo yiel chaylom himachirim apna imatem. Rosim shalom, kabere rabi kabu eri mecha imatem rosim shalom. Zakor el yom hashabat lekwacho Yisrael.
אם אתם רוצים שלום, 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 אם אתה רוצה שלום, אם את רוצה שלום, אל תשכח הצורה אם אתה רוצה שלום, אם את רוצה שלום, אל תשכח הצורה. אם אתה רוצה שלום, אם את רוצה שלום, אל תשכח הצורה. שלום, 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 שלום. אלוהים אחרים הפנן, אם אתם רוצים שלום. כבד את אבי כבוי אל אמך, אם אתם רוצים שלום. זכור את יום השבת וקוואצ'ו ישראל, אם אתם רוצים שלום. שלום, שלום, שלום.
Mata, Mata, Mata. Yahuwah Nelek El Beitenu. Mata, Mata, Mata. Yahuwah Emola Nuna. Mata, Mata, Mata. drummers on the second base we have Chayil Bay Levy let him hear what you play Chayil on the third base we have Mika Hoshea Ben Levy let him hear what you play, Mika. On a bass drum, we have Ellie Melek, Main Levy. Let him hear what you play, Ellie. On the second runners, we have Heat Zidia Yashar Ben Levy. Let him hear what you play, Heat. Bang Levy, let me hear what you play, Mekubaya.
don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so that anytime we upload a new video, you'll be notified. Thank you. Shalom, shalom, family. Once again, Congregation Bay DCB presents a day of praise to the Most High. Unity Shabbat Kum, we must rise. The date, May 28th, 2022, that's Memorial Day weekend. The place, Restoration Plaza, 1368 Fulton Street, Brooklyn, New York. Services will begin at 11 a.m. sharp. For information, please contact us at 347-622-9090 or info at baydcb.org. You won't want to miss this event. Once again, Congregation Bay DCB presents a day of praise to the Most High. Unity Shabbat Kum, we must rise. The date is May 28, 2022. That's the Memorial Day weekend at the Restoration Plaza, 1368 Fulton Street, Brooklyn, New York. Services will begin at 11 a.m. sharply. For more info, please contact us at 347-622-9090 or at info at baydcb.org. You won't want to miss this. Shalom, shalom.
Be alte tell me pida vare metadiot. Chile mis patecha yechalti. Be esh mera torat chatami. Le. Na 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 na
Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so that anytime we upload a new video, you'll be notified. Thank you. Shalom, shalom, family. Once again, Congregation Bay DCB presents a day of praise to the Most High. Unity Shabbat Kum, we must rise. The date, May 28th, 2022, that's Memorial Day weekend. The place, Restoration Plaza, 1368 Fulton Street, Brooklyn, New York. Services will begin at 11 a.m. sharp. For information, please contact us at 347-622-9090 or info at baydcb.org. You won't want to miss this event. Once again, Congregation Bay DCB presents a day of praise to the Most High. Unity Shabbat Kum, we must rise. The date is May 28, 2022. That's the Memorial Day weekend at the Restoration Plaza, 1368 Fulton Street, Brooklyn, New York. Services will begin at 11 a.m. sharply. For more info, please contact us at 347-622-9090 or at info at baydcb.org. You won't want to miss this. Shalom, shalom.
was my thing. Matter of fact, it was my pastime. Sold drugs, fornication, smoke a half time. Now that I know your hoe, what those were bad times. One month, my uncle and grandma passed, those were sad times. Twelve years old, I watched a friend get gunned down. Could have been a victim, but the shooters waited till I crossed the street. Siblings had to reverse their car, they would have shot them too. We lived on the dead end, they had to bust a U turn. Bro was coming in to help y'all visualize the story. They say, see, you got them bars. They say, your hoe, it gets the glory. With the children of y'all cove, ain't no need to go to Mori. Retire at 50 is where I'm shooting like a Mori. Each, I'm sorry for all my past moments. You told me that you love me, I just left you hopeless. To my sister, I'm sorry, Tanisha. Sibling rivalries ain't cool, nor the parents that breed them. I love you. If I ever did you wrong, please forgive me. If I ever threw a stone, please forgive me. If I ever gave you plight, please forgive me. If I never made it right, please forgive me. If I ever did you wrong, please forgive me. If I ever threw a stone, please forgive me. If I ever gave you plight, please forgive me. If I never made it right, please forgive me. This a message to my white friends. My words come with passion. I have no hatred for the white man. To Desi, you always been the closest fam. We don't talk as much. I still love you. Hope you understand. To my family, I'm not better than you. I know the truth about religion. Just trying to share it with you. El Shaddai. I apologize a million times. And for my sins, I pray my children's never penalized. I apologize to anyone I hurt afflicted. A misguided in the beginning when I was learning scripture. Ema, forgive me for the times I was disobedient. I accept the judgments, even if they're not immediate. Rapping about drugs and sex is inexpedient. Torah, love, family, following Yah's the ingredients. Isha told me, stay in my lane, I drove the median. No joking around with Yah's, even Yam is no comedian. I love Yah. If I ever did you wrong, please forgive me. If I ever threw a stone, please forgive me. If I ever gave you plight, please forgive me. If I never made it right, please forgive me. If I ever did you wrong, please forgive me. If I ever threw a stone, please forgive me. If I ever gave you plight, please forgive me. If I never made it right, please forgive me. To anyone I cursed out, loaded burners and bust down. Ignore calls to bust down. Extortion moves on bus routes are punched out. Please forgive me. I found your hoe and I hunched down, one down. I'm just trying to grow to be a better man. Tell you what's real, unlike the weatherman. Yeah, Kai had mercy on the melanin. Made a vow to spread the truth, I'ma tell it then. Keep clicking with scripture quicker. Leviticus give a given. No miseducation, false interpretations to hurt the nation. These corner camps be perpetrating. Calling y'all as descendants a destination. Esau, I right, fam. Then your hat don't say we're wrong for keeping covenant. I'ma tell you now, that's some sucker ish. And if you still wanna clip me, I'm at peace with myself, so I'ma say, please forgive me, I'm gone. If I ever did you wrong, please forgive me. If I ever threw a stone, please forgive me. If I ever gave you plight, please forgive me. If I never made it right, please forgive me. If I ever did you wrong, please forgive me. If I ever threw a stone, please forgive me. If I ever gave you plight, please forgive me. If I never made it right, please forgive me. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so that anytime we upload a new video, you'll be notified. Thank you. Shalom, shalom, family. Once again, Congregation Bay DCB presents a day of praise to the Most High. Unity Shabbat Kum, we must rise. The date, May 28th, 2022, that's Memorial Day weekend. The place, Restoration Plaza, 1368 Fulton Street, Brooklyn, New York. Services will begin at 11 a.m. sharp. For information, please contact us at 347-622-9090 or info at baydcb.org. You won't want to miss this event. Once again, Congregation Bay DCB presents a day of praise to the Most High. Unity Shabbat Kum, we must rise. The date is May 28, 2022. That's the Memorial Day weekend at the Restoration Plaza. 1368 Fulton Street, Brooklyn, New York. Services will begin at 11 a.m. sharply. For more info, please contact us at 347-622-9090 or at info at baydcb.org. You won't want to miss this. Shalom, shalom. I want to praise, I want to praise, I want to praise, I want to praise, I want to praise. He gives me life, I won't survive without my King. 
I want to sing, I want to sing, I want to sing, I want to sing. He gives me life, I won't survive without my king. I want to serve, I want to serve, I want to serve, I want to serve. He gives me life, I won't survive without my king. Come on, come on. When it's over, yeah. when it's said and done, he will be here, the one from which we come. From the beginning, oh, to when we leave, he will be here, so in him I believe. I want to praise, I want to praise, I want to praise, I want to praise. He gives me life, I won't survive without my king. I won't survive without him. I want to serve, I want to serve, I want to serve, I want to serve. He gives me life, I won't survive without my king. I want to sing, I want to sing, I want to sing, I want to sing. He gives me life, I won't survive without my king. Say this. Yahweh, Eloheinu, 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 Yahweh, Eloheinu. Praise your whole, praise your whole, praise your whole. Come on. Shalom, everyone. I want to give all praise and respect to the Creator, the one who allowed us to be alive today.
experience the Unity Shabbat Kum. Get ready to experience the Unity Shabbat Kum, a celebration of praise and glory to the Most High Yah, hosted by Congregation Beit DCB. Join us on May 25th, 2024 at Shell's Loft, Brooklyn, located at 120 Hamilton Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11231. This event promises a day filled with spiritual upliftment, community unity, and joyful fellowship. Come together with fellow brothers and sisters to honor and worship as we celebrate the divine presence in our lives. For more information and to reserve your spot, contact us at 347-622-9090 or email us at info at baydcb.org. Don't miss this opportunity to connect, rejoice, and experience the power of unity and faith. Once again, brothers and sisters, experience the beauty of unity and faith at Unity Shabbat Kum, presented by Congregation Bay DCB. Join us on May 25th, 2024 at Shelf's Laws, Brooklyn, located at 120 Hamilton Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11231. This special day is dedicated to praising the Most High Yah and coming together as a community and worship and celebration. Whether you're seeking spiritual enlightenment or simply looking to connect with like-minded individuals, this event offers an uplifting experience for all. Reserve your spot today by contacting us at 347-622-9090 or emailing us at info at Let's gather in unity and embrace the spirit of togetherness as we honor the divine presence in our lives. Hallelujah. Shalom, shalom. By the rivers of Babylon, yeah, we sat down and we cried when we remembered Jerusalem. We were sick, Lord, near to dying. Oh. singing the song Zed HaShabbat. The song for the start of the Shabbat day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Zed HaShabbat. Name Akani. Zed HaShabbat. Name Akani. Oh, my God. 
giving glory to the most high king. Thanking him for my life. Move closer and shut the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. This is the day of the Lord, and I am happy. The Shabbat day that you have made a covenant, we have made a covenant with you, O great one, this king. 
and you have made a covenant with us that this is what we should gather on the seventh day, O oh great wonders king, and that we give praise to you and learn your laws and your statutes and your covenant and to see what's required for us to do, O oh great wonders king. We thank you for this opportunity, O oh Lord Son. Please continue to bless us. We pray, O oh great wonders king, individually and collectively, O oh great wonders king. And even for those who cry out in silence, O oh great wonders king. Even for those who are sick, O oh great wonders king. Even those who have lost loved ones, O oh most high. Please comfort them, O oh great wonders king. Because thou art great and do wondrous things, O oh most high. Thou, thou art great and do wondrous things, O oh great king. Blessed is you, O oh most high, and your high and holy name, O oh great wonders king. I cannot muster up enough words to give thanks and praise to you. We cannot muster up enough words to give thanks and praise to you, O great wonders king. O most high, please continue to guide us, O great wonders king. Please forgive us if we may slip and fall, O great wonders king, that we rise up, O great wonders king. O most high, you say you will bless us according to our works, O great wonders king. And you said try you, O great wonders king. So we have that opportunity we thank you, O oh Great Wonders King, O oh Son. Please, O oh Great Wonders King, hear our cry, O oh Great Wonders King, O oh Most High. Please hear our cry, O oh Great King. O oh Most High, please bless Gaverit Boney from, um, anyway, she lost her brother, O oh Great Wonders King, and bless her and her family, O oh Great Wonders King, and everyone else that had lost loved ones that I do not know, and whoever was online that lost loved ones, oh great wonders king, please comfort all of us, oh great wonders king, oh great king. And the dawn age, oh great wonders king, bless his Abba, oh great wonders king, and give him strength also, oh most high. And then the dawn age, have his safe trip back from visiting his father, oh great wonders king. And uh, Maury, Dawi in uh, South Carolina, bless him. I spoke with him this morning. He's a little under the sun. Oh, great wonders king under the weather. Oh, great king, bless him. Bless that elder and all the elders. Oh, great wonders king. Please continue to bless all our children also as they go and come. Oh, great wonders king. And even the young ones that got to work and take trains and buses. Oh, great wonders king. Make it safe for them. And those who are in college. Oh, great wonders king. Continue to guide them also. Oh, great wonders king. Wonders King and give them strength, O Most High. Thanking you again, O Great Wonders King, for all that you have been blessing us with, O Most High. And Most High, please continue to bless me to heal also, O Great Wonders King, O Most High. <laughs> you and I know, O Great Wonders King, what I went through, O Great King. And I thank you, O Great Wonders King, that I can still get about, O Great Wonders King. And, uh, please continue to heal all of us. That's Ellen. And please, O oh Great Wonders King, accept this service. O oh Great Wonders King, we give praise to you. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the mighty Yah. Praise the mighty Yah. Oh,
second song being found on page 10 in our Siddur, which is our prayer book. A 90-second song, hallelujah. hallelujah. It is a good thing to give thanks unto Yehovah and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night, upon the instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the heart with the solemn sound. For thy Yehovah has made me glad through thy work. I will triumph from the works of thy hands, how great are thy works of your whole and thy thoughts of every deed. A brutish man knoweth not neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up as grass, when all workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, your whole, art most high forevermore. For lo, thy enemies, so your whole, for lo, thy enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. For my horn shall die exalt like the horn of the wild ox. I am anointed with fresh oil. My eye also have seen the desire of my enemies. And my ears have heard the desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of your host shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall so bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. To show that your host is upright. He is my rock and there is no righteousness in him. Hallelujah. The 125th Psalm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They that trust in your host shall be as Mount Zion. 
which cannot be removed by the bodies forever. As the mouth to the right about Jerusalem, so Jehovah is right about his people from henceforth even forever. For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands into iniquity. Do good, O Jehovah, to those that be good, and to them that are upright in their hearts. As the such turn aside and turn cook of ways, your host shall lead them forth with the works of iniquity, but peace shall be upon Israel. Hallelujah. Going to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, starting from verse 4. Shema Yisrael, Yehoah Eloheinu, Yehoah Echad. Hero Yisrael, Yehoah our God, Yehoah is one. And I shall love Yehoah thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be upon thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be for frontless between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thy house, and upon thy gates. And it shall be when Jehovah thy God shall bring thee into the land, which he saw unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Yishak, and to Yaakov, to give thee great and goodly cities as thy builders now. And houses full of all good things which thou fillest not. Wells dig which thou diggest not. Vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then be well lest thou forget your whore, who brought thee forth from the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear your whore thy God and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. He shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people that are round about you, for your whore thy God is a jealous God amongst you. Lest the anger of your whore thy God be kindled against thee. And he destroyed thee from the face of the earth. Hallelujah. Therefore, we honor and extol the God of our fathers for restoring us back to our heritage, even here in the land of our captivity. We thank thee and praise thee with all our might. And we say, Blessed is the name of your whole our God forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let us sing the Shema. Shema. Yes, right. Yeah. spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily shall keep my chateau, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am Jehovah who sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Shabbat, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that profaneth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever do of any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh days the Shabbat of solemn rest, holy to your whole. Whosoever do of any work in the Shabbat day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe the Shabbat throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. The heaven and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, Yah finished his work which he had made. And Yah blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because that any he rested from all his work which God in creating had made. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please repeat after me. If thou turn away thy foot because of the Shabbat. If thou turn away thy foot because of the Shabbat. From pursuing thy business on my holy day. From pursuing thy business on my holy day. And call the Shabbat a delight. And call the Shabbat a delight. And the holy of your whole are honorable. And the holy of your whole are honorable. And shall honor it. And shall honor it. Not doing thy wanted ways. Not doing thy wanted ways. Nor pursuing thy business. Nor pursuing thy business. Nor speaking thereof. Nor speaking thereof. Then shall I delight thyself in Yehovah. And I'll make thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. And I'll feed thee with the heritage of Yaakov thy father. 
For the mouth of Yehoah has spoken it. Hallelujah. We love for thee, O Yehoah, our God. We have entered our great house to welcome the Shabbat day, which invites us to enjoy the blessings of rest and peace. Thou art near to us in this place, and wherever we call upon thee, thou will come to us and bless us. On this Shabbat day, may we look back upon this past week and reflect earnestly upon the way we have used the fleeting moments. Be with us in the coming week that we may be faithful to all our duties. Make us glad that there is so much joy in this house. May we ever be eager to spread around the light of happiness, of love, and goodwill. May this day bring peace to our hearts and joy to our souls. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us sing the Shema. Shema, 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 Shema.
Kelly say you ain't gonna leave it on that note. <laughs> so I'm gonna have my say in this matter. Told I yeah, blessed be the most high king of the universe, the host of our hope. Thanking the most high king for life, food, clothing, and shelter, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I'm grateful to this mighty king for all of us that we made it here safely. Also praying for those who are on their way that the most high will cost to get here safely. And I pray that the creator of heaven and earth be with us all. God and protect us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, you may be seated. Thanking the creator for in one second. Thanking the most high for all things and everything. And I'm grateful for life that we're here, that we're able to call upon his name, that we're able to um to praise him, because you know, things we take for granted, um, other people don't even have the pleasure of doing. So we have to be grateful to the most high God that we have all of our faculties, that we're able to come before him, that we're able to stand, that we're able to see and talk and and scream and yell and call upon his name. Some people can't see it. You ever wonder, like a blind person, they never saw anything, so they don't know how a person looks like. They could, they could feel people's faces, but you never know how somebody looks like. Now you have people that, so how do they dream? Do they dream? Just think about that. We have dreams that help us escape and daydream and we could think about things. What do they think of? But even with that, they're still grateful for what they have, which is life. God didn't give them vision, but they're grateful for what they have, which is life. Right? So we have to be grateful for everything that the Most High God gives us. We can't be ungrateful. We see so many things that's happening before us, and we just have to know as God's people that we, um, we have to keep it together. We have to be the light amongst those that are in darkness. We have to be the, um, the willow amongst the grass, and we have to stand out. And, and standing out, you're going to have challenges. People are going to, you know, ask what you are about. People are going to challenge what you are about. But you know what? Even with all that being said, when you stand up strong and you do the things you're supposed to do, the Most High would always see you through. I've never had a time when God has failed me, ever, when I needed him the most. When I, could, when I could talk about who I am and I could explain to people who I am and what I am, the Most High has never failed me. You know why? Because he never leaves us hanging. He never leaves us hanging. He's always there when, when we need him the most. So I'm grateful that the mighty king is, is my king, that he's my God, and that I serve him. We, um, we see ourselves in so many situations I seen that O.J. Simpson passed away this um, this actual week, and some of y'all might not know who O.J. O.J. Simpson is. You know, some of y'all were too young to understand really the the impact and the magnitude of O.J. Simpson as an athlete, and then just as a as a person and what what happened with him and how things transpired with him and how it polarized this this actual country. It turned. You really wanted to see black against white? That was the time during the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, not so much what happened in the trial and the things that might have came forward in the trial, but there was a, it was a mix of everything that we saw in society during that time. We seen a black man that um, was accused of, of two murders, right? He was... He was not convicted, but he was accused of two murders. He had to go through trial. And he actually had the means and the money to get a, a group of lawyers that they called the Dream Team that was able to beat that actual case for him. Because it was, you know, that's whatever my opinion is. I'm just painting the picture of what was happening during that time. Right? And, um, when that man got off, you seen the, the vitriol and you seen the hate that this other people had towards us. They couldn't believe that this man got off for what they believed in their heart that he committed this, these crimes. But they been using the same justice system to get away with things that they were wronging for years. The, the man who 
kill Emmett Till. They were judged by, quote, unquote, a, a jury of their peers, and they beat that case. When there were witnesses and there were people that said that they were the ones who did it, but they beat that case. So this man came along, he beat his case, he beat all the, all the, you know, the, the, the criminal case. Um, they got him later on the civil case, but on the criminal case, he didn't have to do any, any jail time on that. So a lot of you don't understand the magnitude of this, of this person, this character that we, that we talk about named O.J. Simpson, besides just being, you know, a, um, a great football player and a great athlete in America. He was also a person who polarized this country, you know, on two different ends. So do a little research on that. Um, you know, I got my opinions on it, but I know what this, I know what these people do. And I know what they like to do. And that's the court system that they set up. So if you set it up and he won in the system that you set up, you can't come back and then try to prosecute the man again because there's a thing called double jeopardy. You can't, you can't try somebody twice on something that they already beat in the court system. So... Um, with that being said, you know, he, I guess, condolences to his family, to his children, you know, because um, he was some, someone that, when I was growing up, had an impact on society and what we saw reality to be. And when they tell us that racism doesn't exist anymore, there's always an event or something that happens that show you front and center that racism, you know, have, it's still there because he he didn't even hang around black people. You ever you ever hear the Jay Z song? He said, "I'm not black. I'm OJ." Okay, because that's how he that's how he felt. He said, "I'm not black. I'm OJ." That means I'm accepted everywhere. But he knew during that time that he was black. He understood during that time that he was black, and that's why we can't lose our perspective as black people in America. We, all, we have to always have our minds open and understand that at any time it can happen to any one of us or our children. So we always have to walk in the path that the Most High God created for us, and that's the path we will be safe in. Right? Never forget what you are and who you are, because the minute you start forgetting that, you start going to the side, and the protection of the Most High leaves you. So uh, with that being said, we're going to move straight ahead, and we're going to move on with the Torah service for today. And for that, I'm going to call on my brother, Chief Mechabadi of Anchor 11. Hallelujah. 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 Giving all honor and praise, respect, glory, and allegiance to our God and our King. The Holy One, the Holy One, Israel. We all want to say hallelujah. Hallelujah. At this time, brothers and sisters, we're going to open up our Torah portion of the day. But before doing so, we're going to sing even the song HaTorah. But we're going to pay talk HaTorah, which means to open the book of the law. Found on page, I believe, 15 in Asador. Ah, <laughs> Our heart, it is to be 
by the Hashem Shel Yehovah, Baruch Yehovah Yom Yom, Baruch Yehovah Tamid, Uvaruch Haba Lekrei Hatora, Mode Ani Lefenecha Yehovah Elohim, Natan Lanu Et Hatora. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we will be reading from the book of Waikra, the twelfth chapter, starting from the first verse. We are in the portion of Tazria. Tazria. I'll let the, the person who's doing the portion break that down later. But brothers and sisters, we're going to read in the tongue of our ancient fathers. I'm going to be calling up seven readers, including the Maftir. And the first reader will be our own Nasik. So we'll begin the Torah portion. Nikra'et Nasik Yeriel Ben Yisaskar Ben Yisrael. Baruch Yahovah Yom Yom. Baruch Yahovah Tami Ubaruch Abah Lekare HaTorah Amen. He will be reading from Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Sisters may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We're in the book of Leviticus, chapter 12, starting from verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Yehoah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If the woman be delivered, and there be a child, and she shall bear a son, and the son shall be called Yehoah, and Yehoah shall call him And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Modi manapnula shea cha welo he nu welo he abote nu Abraham yiska we ya ko le olangwa e nikra e hatora nikra e kasire o ben yehuda ben Israel. Uvaru kaba lekare hatora. Mode anina paneka yaho. 
Amen. You'll be reading from chapter 13, verses 6 through 8. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are a Hakohen Oto by Yom Hashem Viha Shevi E. Shenit. We hine Keha Hanega. We lo Fasa Hanega Baor. We T Haro Hakohen Miss Pakat. Heave. We Kibes Begadav. We Tar hair. We im pasa tip se hamis pakat baor akore he ra toto el hakohen leta har rato. We need a wenira shenit el hakohen. We ra a hakohen we hine pas. Pastak Hamis Pakat Baor We Tim O Hakohen Sadaat Saraat Heave. Amen. Amen. We're in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, verses 6 through 8. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the priest shall look on him again the seventh day, and behold, if the plague be dim, and the plague be not spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. And the priest shall look and behold, if the scab be spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a leprosy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Modi manapnula. She ata wello he nu, wello he avote nu. Abraham yiska, we a ko le olam rae. Nikraet seren el kwana ben rose el kwana ben Yehuda ben Yisrael. Baruch Yahovah yom yom, Baruch Yahovah tami, Uva Baruch haba lekroe hatora. Amen. You will be reading from Leviticus chapter 13, verses 18 through 20. Uvasar ki i ye, vo ve oro shechin we nir pa. Veya bim kum hashchin se eit, levana o baheret, levana ad adam demet, we nir a al hakohen. Vera a hakohen we hine mar eha, sapal min ha or ush ara, hapak lavan. We team O, a cohen nega, Zaraat Hio, Vashim, Paraha. Amen. We in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, verses 18 through 20. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when the flesh have in the skin thereof a boil, and it is healed. And the priest shall look and behold. If the appearance thereof be lower than the skin, and the hair thereof be turned white, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is the plague of leprosy. It hath broken out in the boil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Abraham Nikra et tae ben zaka ben dam ben Israel. Baruch Yahovah yom yom. Baruch Yahovah tami. Uvaruch haba lekre hatora. Amen. We will be reading from Leviticus chapter 13, verses 24 through 26. Of a sarki, Kiki, or Mikwa ish, Wahaita, Wahaita, Mikia, Mikia, Hamikwa, but her Lavana, Adam, Demet, or Lavana, where I ought to have Kohen, Wikine, Nepax, Lavan, Baba Hare, Umar Eha, and Mog Minha or Sora Adhi, Bamikwa, Paraka, with Batime, Otto Hakohen, Negatur Adhi. 
Amen. Amen. We're in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, verses 34 to 36. 24 to 26. 24 to 26. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But when the flesh have in the, in the skin thereof a burning by fire, and the quick flesh of the burning become a bright spot, reddish white or white, But if the priest look on it and behold, there be no white hair in this bright spot, and it be no lower than the than the skin, but be dim, then the priest shall shut him up seven days. Hallelujah. 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 Nikrai Eli Melek Ben More Erania Ben Kohen Levi Ben Israel. Baruch Yahovah Yom Yom. Baruch Yahovah Tami. Uvaruch Haba Likrai Hatora. Amen. You will be reading from Leviticus chapter 13, verses 29 through 31. Ish o isha ki yihie bo naga, Orosh o bazahuan, Ra aha kohen et hanega, where he named Mar Ehu, Amo Amo mean ha or Uvo se ar zahov zahov dak, what he may oto ha kohen netech, who zar ata harosh o hazahuan, who Waki yer e ha kohen et nega. Han Hanetek Wahine and Mar Mar Ehu Amoh Min Haor Wase 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 Ar Sahor and Bo Wahis Wahis Gira Hakohen at Nega Hanetek Shiv At Yamin. Amen. We're in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verses 29 to 31. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when a man or a woman have a plague upon the, the head or upon the bed, And if the skull, sleeka, and if the priest look on the plague of the skull, and behold, the appearance thereof be not deeper than the skin, and there be no black hair in it, then the priest shall shut up him that have the plague of the skull seven days. Hallelujah. 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 Nikrae, Yahoshua Ben Ben Yamin, Ben Yisrael. Baruch Yahoah, Yom Yom. Baruch Yahoah, Tami. Uvaruch Haba, Likrae Hatora. Amen. 
Hallelujah. We're in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, verses 40 to 42. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if a man's hair be falling off his head, he is bald, yet is he clean. But if there be in the bald head or, or the bald forehead a reddish white plague, it is leprosy breaking out in his bald head or his bald forehead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Baruch Yahovah Yom Yom Baruch Yahovah Tami Ubaruch Haba Lekrev HaTorah Amen. We'll be reading Leviticus chapter 13, verses 55 and 56. We're in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, verses 55 and 56. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the priest shall look, and after that the plague is washed. And behold, if the plague have not changed its color, and the plague be not spread, it is unclean. Thou shalt burn it in the fire. It is a fret, whether the bareness be within or without. Amen. You'll be reading Leviticus chapter 13, verses 57 through 59. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wa im te terae od beged o vashti o va arev o va kal kali o horakat hil ba ish tis a benu et ashir et ashibo hanaga waha beged. O hashti, o haarev, o haokali, hao, ashir, tachabes, wasa, mehim, hadnaga, waku, wakubes, shenit, watahir, zolt, torah, nege, sa, nege, sa, Neke tsara raat bege hat semir o ha o ha pishtin o hashtin ha rev o ka khali o la el el taro o el tamo. Amen. 
We're in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, verses 57 to 59. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if it appeared still in the garment, or in the wall, or in the wolf, or in, any, or in anything of the skin, it is breaking out. Thou shalt burn that wherein the plague is with fire. And the garment, or the wall, or the wolf, or whatsoever thing of skin it be, which thou shalt wash, if the plague be departed from them, then it shall be washed a second time, and shall be clean. This is the law of the plague of leprosy in a garment of wool or linen, or in the warp, or in the wolf, or in anything of skin, to pronounce it clean or to pronounce it unclean. Hallelujah. 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 Toda Rabat El Shada for another young Shabbat day. I want to say Toda Rabat El Shada for allowing me to have the breath of life to be able to sit before my people again. Taught our about El Shaddai, he not only woke me up, but everyone within the confines of the four walls in my home. May the Most High continuously bless us all. I would like to give due respect to the leader of the congregation, Prince Yeriel Ben Asaskar. May the Most High continuously bless him and his family, and all those online, those in person, and even, like I said, those in the four walls of my house. Shabbat Shalom, and may the Most High bless us. Uh, may your whole also bless the meditation of my mind and my mouth as I go forward. And before I start uh, this this portion, like I you like how I so often like to do, I like to draw a correlation from what the Maftir portion is about to where we are in the current state of us today. And um, before I get there, this was this it's it's been trying week. The Most High has been blessing me in abundance, so I'm not going to complain at all. And normally when I Feel the need to complain. I just say, Toda Yahoo, bring on some more adversity so I can show you how firm I am. Um, studying and going into this, I was kind of wrestling with a couple of things, and I was wrestling with myself. I'm pretty sure speaking with Uzayel and Brother Arania, they'll tell you, like, been mad busy and um, just been conflicted on some things. But this portion, in a sense, as I'm sitting here right now, I can understand why. I was at, it was meant for me to do this portion. Uncleanliness, I'm not going to step on the, uh, the teacher for later on today, but uh, this portion in this Sidra, this week, we're talking about the, the cleanliness, the body. And once I started really digging into this and getting an understanding and looking how my, well, my week was transpiring, I realized that uncleanliness doesn't just extend from the body, it's a mentality. So that's where I'm about to hit the head on. Um, and, and cleanliness, yes, we have our periods of separation. We have the chance by night. We have the contact with a dead body. We have the leprosy, which we are talking about, the, 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 the uncleanliness in the skin. But before we talk about the physical aspect, there's some mental parts that goes along with it because you can't we can't be in this walk of life and know the ins and outs of the laws of uncleanliness and separation in the body without mentally fortifying ourselves and protecting ourselves against these certain in, uh, instances and things and the whole point of why i'm driving the mental part is once i get towards the end of this portion we can take a look and see how uncleanliness in the skin also is a reflection of uncleanliness in the mind. So as I, before I like to start, like I said, may the most high bless the meditation of my mouth and my mind. Um, Israel, while I got you for these couple of minutes, I'm gonna let you all know I love y'all. Everyone who sees me and hear me right now, Israel or not, I love you. And may the most high bless you in abundance and be great. Mediocrity is no longer acceptable, especially within our midst. And the, again, the leprosy, the uncleanliness in the flesh, it's also a mental aspect behind it. And that's what I'm going to try to tap into. So I love you all and let's be great together. So our portion is going to take uh, place in Second Kings. 
And we're going to be starting from the fourth chapter, starting from the 42nd verse. Hallelujah. A man came to Baal Sh uh, Shalisha, and he brought the man of Yehoah some bread for the first reaping, 20 loaves of barley bread and some fresh grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. His attendant replied, how can I set this before a hundred men? But he said, give it up to the people and let them eat. For thus Yehoah, for thus, Ye for thus said Yehoah, they shall eat and have some left over. So he said it before them, and when they had eaten, there was some left over, as Yehoah had said. Let me just stop right there. So the attendant was looking like, how are we going to feed all these folks with just a couple, with just this little bit right here and there? This ain't shaking so much. But the prophet had to told them that the most I already spoke and said that they shall eat and some be left over. Mental. How many times have, how many because this is my fifth year anniversary, told out Yehovah for me and my family getting into this, and we still wrestle some things. But how many times do we read throughout all these portions throughout the year, thus said Yehovah, law, statute, commandments, this, that. Why do we continuously question what God asked before us? And then when we have the correct leadership and they tell us what to do, why do we constantly always have to question what's laid before us? Just like with Moshe in the wilderness, when he said, when he sent them to uh, to go get the report, and they come back, the most hard he said it was ours. He said, just go scope out the land. They come back with a wicked report. How many times do we keep hearing what's set before us, and we always sidestep and tiptoe? That's that mental aspect. So, like the prophet said, just give it to them, as as the most high already said. They shall eat and there shall be some left over. And once the attendant did that, everybody ate and there's some left over. We always look at stuff as a miracle or this over the top thing. Sometimes everything doesn't have to be over the top or a miracle. It can just be that outline in fact of just putting faith and trust in the most high and just doing what is called and required and mentally fortifying ourselves, knowing the God we serve, knowing the God gonna get, knowing the job gonna get done, just doing our part. This is gonna help up with the build up to the end of the portion. I'm gonna read through a good chunk of five, but we shall continue. Chapter five. Now, my commander of the army of the king of Aram was important to his Lord and high in his favor, for through him, Yehoah had granted victory to Aram. That's something else I'm gonna get at later. But the man, but the man, though a great warrior, was a leper. Once when the Arameans were out raiding, they carried off the young girl from the land of Israel, and she became an attendant to Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish master could be before the prophet in Samaria. He will cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel said, and the king of Aram said, go to the king of Israel, and we'll send along a letter. He set out taking with him talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of rain. He brought the letter to the king of Israel. It read, now when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent my courier Naaman to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he rent his clothes and cried, am I God to deal death or give life that this fellow writes me to cure a man of leprosy? Just see for yourselves, he is seeking a pretext against me. I'm gonna stop right there. So if you're really not following the context of the story, like, okay, Naaman is like that dude on the battlefield for the Arameans. So he hears about the God of Israel and what the God of Israel can do, or you know, what the men of God through through the uh our God of Israel, what he can do. So he set forth and took a trek, but he reached out to the king like, hey, make these provisions and write this up for me. So let me go see what's going on. So the king of Israel, he gets the letter and he's looking like, what the heck is this? So to get y'all in the mentality, imagine King David going to meet the Philistines to inquire to them about something. The first thing they're gonna think is, why is David coming over here? This is a setup, this is a setup. So immediately the king rents his garments and goes into lament mode because he thinking they're about to set something up. They, they, they're up to something. They're clearly up to something. But 
in that letter, he's, he's asking about your God. So now I'm finna go back and talk. When you mentally fortified and you doing what's right, people are always gonna find ways, whether it's, hey, I got a question, or I hear this a lot, you're, you're a very spiritual, righteous guy, you, you, you tell it how it is. What do you think about this instance? People will reach out, but you have to be mentally fortified to be able to weed through what's you know, right and wrong. So he mentally going to let me roll, wear his garments. Somebody's just inquiring to you about your God. What does that tell me? In today's time, don't always get on the defense. We know who our one true living God is. We also need to exercise the fact of being able to know that our God is a deliverer, our God is a healer, our God is a savior. So when people come to us for prayer, you go and you give that to them. We also know when things come our way in instances, yes, we call upon the name of the Most High, but if we mentally fortify, we ain't got to rent our garments and just break down right then and there. Have some composure. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you rent your clothes? Let him come to me, and he will learn that there is a prophet in Israel. Immediately, he like, he had that prophet, that same thing, like, why don't you put your garments? Man, I got chill. Send them over my way. If, you, if, you, if you're not mentally fortified to see what's going on, that he's calling upon our God, send him to me. And I'm going to show him there's a prophet in Israel. I'm going to show him there's a savior in our God. I'm mentally fortified, so I'm going to take this individual and I'm going to show him. That's how we need to be. People always come and ask, why do you wear those on the four corners of your garments? Numbers 15, verses 37 through 38, boom. Oh, I heard that before. I didn't know. I really never seen nobody follow it. When we mentally do what we need to do, people will try us, but people will also seek wisdom from us. Ain't that what it is? It says we seek this book and we shall be shown as a righteous and wise people. Just like the prophet said, what you, well, chill, send him my way. I'm mentally fortified. I, I'll show him and give him what he's seeking. Let us continue. So now Amon came with the horses and the chariots and halted at the door of Elisha's home. Elisha sent the messenger, messenger to him saying, go and bathe seven times in the Jordan. They're going to number again. Go and bathe seven times in the Jordan and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But now Amon was angered and walked away. I thought he said, I thought he said he would surely come out to me and he would stand and invoke Yehovah, his Elohim by name and would have his hand and have his hand toward the spot and cure the, the affected part and not the uh, uh, the Amanon and the uh, par, uh, what's that, Papar, the rivers of Damascus, so he's now naming rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel, I could bathe in them and be clean, and he stalked off in a rage, let me keep going a little bit, but his servants came forward and spoke to him, sir, they said, if the prophet told you to do something difficult, would you not do it? How much more he has only said to you, bathe and be clean. So before I keep going, that's a lot of people today. It, it, it's crazy to think like he, he comes to the prophet, he gets what he wants. He's like, hey, go do this. And he immediately gets upset. The, isn't that us today? And some of our people, our contemporaries who don't understand this walk of life, we always think, the most high has we we always talk we always hear these stories these make-believe stories about gods and how they did this and how they did that and we try to hold our god to a standard of something over the top has to happen in order to get get a blessing no the last time i recall this scripture he said it's so easy for a child to understand so it's not over the top and we can get our blessing we have to learn from him we can't be angered by the small stuff. Now, the most, like, I, the best example I can use, the most I said, uh, six days y'all should work, and on the seven days a day at rest, give praise and do diligence unto him. And we twist our face and get so mad. We, we, we have step. We started at this time. We do it that way differently. We come up with all these different things. We, we go pick up overtime. We do everything but it requires for us to do. And he only said one day. That remind that kind of reminded me of this. He said, hey, just go bathe in the river. Go wash yourself seven times. And he threw a fit. 
What if he told you go on the river and do it 49 times or 777 times? Well, nah, mom probably going, oh, okay. He said, just go on the river and watch seven times. He got picks. He didn't get him nothing difficult to do. And that's, like I said, my six days, you can do whatever you want. You can work, you can do what you want, but the seven days is a day of rest to me. That's the correlation that I'm using today. And we mentally not fortified. We still twist our face up at that. We can't be like, nah, mom. And we have to teach our brothers and sisters who's not in this walk of life just because you don't get a response from the most high when you want, you throw a fit. The most high works on his time. So he went down and immersed himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had bidden, and his flesh became like a little boy and he was clean. Returning with his entire uh, retinue to the man of God, he stood before him and he explained, now I know that there is a God in the whole world. Uh, now I know that there is no God in the whole world except in Israel. So please accept the gift from your servant. But he replied, as Yehovah lives, whom I serve, I will not accept anything. He pressed him to accept, but he refused. And Naaman said, then at least let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will never again offer a burnt offering or a sacrifice to any God except Yehovah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now that's gonna helps us in today's time. We have brothers and sisters and people who call it. I see it all the time. I have a, a brother who I built with down here. He started getting into the walk. He started doing the Yom Shabbat from evening into evening, and we converse and we break. And we converse and we break bread. And um he like he knows that there's a God in Israel. He shows. When the one true living God does his bidding and work, it changes people. That's how I got into this walk of life. I was serving an idol all these years, but it was that communication where I prayed for something so specific and it happened right there on the spot. Like, I know that that's God. I know this guy, hey, Ishak, we got to follow this guy. This is what we got to do because he showed this God is real and now mine is doing that. He's not an Israelite, but he knows who the one true living God is. That's a blessing. Pardon your servant for this. When my master enters the temple, a reminds to bow low and worship there. And he is leaning on my arm so that I must bow low in the temple, a Ramon. When I bow low in the temple, a Ramon, may Yehovah pardon your servant for this. And he said to him, go in peace. What he's admitting is, I know that your God is real. I know that the God of Israel is the God that lives, but what me and my people do, what me and my leadership do, they'll frown if I don't do it. We have a lot of our people who are on the fence and who wants to walk over to this side of this walk of life, but they're on the fence. They're worried about what their parents would think. They're worried about uh, what Sister Johnson and so-and-so of them uh, in the pew pits to say. They're worried about uh, Deacon Johnson and them. They're they worried about everybody else instead of having a relationship with the Most High. And that's when we have to be brothers and sisters and be mentally fortified and show them that serving is true. One, one true living God is the way to go. Just like Naaman has seen through the prophet Elisha. He, he, some, they'll, you know, people be on the fence and I realized it too. We always hard on our people, and there's nothing wrong with that. Rebuke thy brother openly, but our people are blinded in madness and confusion. We have to have some level of understanding and compassion. And Alicia did too. Instead of being like, no, you already said who our one true living God is. Look at your skin. You're clean. You look like a new boy now. You ain't out here bad. You gonna get praised that he know the circumstances. He know that this man is a foreigner and his people, they subjected to do things differently. But he know that the man was being humble and poured his spirit out saying, please forgive me. Huh? Please forgive me. Your servant understands who the God, the, the God that in Israel is, but this is what's going on. We have to be understanding what our brothers and sisters today. And I don't realize that outside of the music, I realize when I approach a brother and sister to let them know, spoon feed them, don't shell shock them to up front and have understanding. But I'm mentally fortified now from where I used to be at to know that everybody isn't blessed to just get it. Everybody has to get that the, they spirit worked in order to draw near to the most high. 
but with the last sentence to go to it, when he had gone some distance from him, let me continue. Oh yeah, he said go in peace. Um, wow, I, I really ran through that. But the whole point of the aspect of where I'm getting at it, I want to continue a little bit in through five just for the sake of it. That's why I'm saying that cleanliness is also a mental thing. So Gezri is a tenant of Alicia, the man of God, thought, my master has let the air me in. Now I'm off without accepting what he had brought. As Yehoah lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw something running after him, he, he aligned from the chariot to meet him and said, it's all well. All is well, he replied. My master has sent me to say, to say to you, disciples of the prophets had just come to me from the hill country Ephraim. Please get him a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. Naaman said, please take two talents. He urged him and he wrapped the two talents of silver in two bags and gave them along with changes of clothes on uh, to the two of his servants who, uh, who, carried, who carried them ahead of him. When Gazi arrived at the citadel, he took the things from them and de uh, deposited them into the house. Then he was dismissed. Then he dismissed the men and they went their way. He entered and stood before his master. And Alicia said to him, where have you been, guys? He replied, your servant has not gone anywhere. Lies. Alicia said to him, did not my spirit go along with a man uh, when a man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this a time to take money in order to buy clothing and olive groves and vineyard sheep, ox and male and female slaves? Surely the leprosy of Naaman should cling to you and your descendants forever. I wanted to continue and use that part to talk where I wanted to go with this. You have to be mentally fortified. Elisha gave all the due credit to the most high. The man came to a prophet looking to be healed. The prophet gave him the, the understanding of who the most high is and blessed him to be healed. And he took nothing from him because all glory and praise goes to the most high. The Alicia, the prophet, taking anything would have signified, I'm doing this, so I'm taking payment. But Elisha said, no, I don't take anything. I want you to come here looking to get healed, and you get your healing, and know that the God of Israel lives, and that was the blessing. Someone coming to look for healing and got more than a healing. They got the most high and know how to praise the one true living God. Where am I going with this? Let's not be like the servant who goes out and tries to obtain something. Let's stop looking for gain, praising the most high. Let's stop trying to look to get something in return by leading our people to the most high. Your gain is seeing your brothers and sisters wake up from idolatry. So he goes out to try to get a gain and take the glory from the most high. And the outsider who turned to the most high who was relieved of the leprosy and he now was mentally fortified and clean having an understanding of God you taking the glory from the most high now you inherit his leprosy mentally because you're not there you unclean so uncleanliness does not stick within the skin it's it's also inside of our mental so with me to wrap this up so I'm not taking too much time let's quit looking for uh, just as things as face value or skin value deep. It's our mental. We have to build ourselves mentally in order to serve this God so we not just unclean in the skin, but we're not unclean in the minds and within our hearts. May Yahweh continue to bless me and may he, plead, may he have forgiveness and compassion upon me if I have said anything that's not right or I have led anyone astray. And may he continuously build me so I can get better at coming up here before my people. I love you all, Yisrael. May Yehovah bless you in abundance. And may we magnify and praise his name together on this blessed holy Shabbat day. Shabbat Shalom. I love you. Take care, Yisrael. And thank you, DCB. Hallelujah. Thank you the most high God for our brothers at Ev Ben Benyamin for his dissertation of the Mav Tears portion. At this time, brothers and sisters, we're going to close out the Torah portion by singing the song HaTorah, but this time we're going to say Go HaTorah, which means to close the book of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. HaTorah. Ha Say go high.
seated giving praise and honor to Jehovah God and thanking him for our lives, thanking him for strength, thanking him for good health, thanking him for all that Amen. he's done for us and allowing us this opportunity to worship before him and to call upon him on this holy day, Amen. praying that the presence of the Most High would be with us here in this place and in all of the places that he is allowing the children of Israel to gather before him today. We thank Jehovah God for teaching us his commandments and statutes and his judgments, thanking him for even allowing us to be alive this day. Thanking him again for allowing us to know who he is. Thanking him for allowing us to know who we are. That's right. Yeah. For knowing who we are puts us in a different position than many people upon the face of the earth. Because as there are billions of people upon this earth that Jehovah God has created, it's a small portion of those billions that know of his name and know of his fame. And we happen to be part of that. Mm. So it's an opportunity that we should not take for granted, but take full advantage of this opportunity in order to serve the Most High, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one that in the beginning of the Holy Scriptures is said, in the beginning, God created the heavens That's and the right. earth. So as we read throughout the Holy Scriptures, as we acknowledge him alone as the creator, 
where he says that him, his name alone is to be praised, where he says that he alone is the savior and him alone is, or he alone is the redeemer. So there is none that can compare to Jehovah God because there is none with him, none before him. That's right. And there would be none, there were none before him, none with him, and there would be none after him. Amen. For in the beginning when there was nothing, he spoke and he brought everything into existence. And he's the one that spoke our existence, each and everybody that is here, everybody that's watching, everybody in every place that is gathered this day, that he is the one that spoke. And our existence is based on his words and him breathing the breath of life within us. So we had to take, again, full advantage of this opportunity to serve him all the days of our lives and make sure that we do the best that we can to not sin against him, to not commit iniquities, and not commit transgressions. We are going to continue on in the reading of the Holy Scriptures, where we are continuing, where we will begin in Leviticus chapter 12. Today, in praying that the Most High would open up our lips, let our mouths declare his praise. Let him teach us the truth of his word so that we may acquire knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of the things that we should know, the things that we should be wise on, and the things that we should obtain understanding in. And ultimately learning to make that difference, as he specified it in the prior reading, between the unclean and the clean. Mm -hmm. So the section of the Holy Scriptures that we are reading is a section that deals with the unclean and the clean, mm -hmm. or speaks about another terminology ritual purity versus ritual impurity, or spiritual contamination versus being clean. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that are encompassed within this portion, starting from Leviticus chapter 11, all the way to Leviticus chapter 15. So we read in, and how this section starts, because we read in Leviticus chapter 10, after the death of Aaron's sons, in, ver in chapter 10, in verse 9, in verse 8, it says, And Jehovah spoke unto Aaron, saying, Drink no wine, nor strong drink. Thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tent of meeting, that you die not. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation. So that statute is for the priests, the ones that come out of the line of Aaron. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that comes after that, it says that you may put difference between the holy and the common and between the unclean and the clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which Jehovah has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Mm -hmm. So the priests have to understand that distinction between the holy and the common, between the clean and the unclean. And therefore, as they're teaching that, we have to make that distinction as well. It's important for us to know the difference between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, and to live within that dis with live knowing those differences. We read in the book of Leviticus chapter 19, it says, you shall be holy for Jehovah God is holy. So holiness is something that we're supposed to be all the time. Now, we're not going to be clean all the time. There are going to be various things that causes us to become unclean. That's why there is a difference between holy and clean. You can be holy and still be unclean. But we get into those differences because as we get into Leviticus chapter 12, and it talks about a woman that bears a child and gives birth She's unclean, but that doesn't mean that she's not holy. So again, that's why we have to know that there's a difference between these two subjects, holy and common, unclean and clean. And the narrative stops in after chapter 10 to tell us about the things that make us unclean and the things that purify us so that we can become clean. So Leviticus chapter 11, what, we, what did we learn about? The beasts that are on the earth that are unclean and that are clean. Mm -hmm. We learn about the fish or the sea creatures that are unclean and that are clean. Mm -hmm. We learn about the birds that are unclean. We learn about how do you become unclean through any of those beasts that are unclean. Right. And then in chapter 12, we're going to get into childbirth. We're going to get into 13, which talks about what, we, what is translated as leprosy. In chapter 15, we learn about if a man has a what is known today as a STD. We also know that the flow of seed comes out of a man. He becomes unclean. Also, at the end of Leviticus chapter 15, a woman, when she has a menstrual cycle. Those are the things that we read about in, in chapters 11 through 15 that deal with the unclean and the clean. And then it goes back into Leviticus chapter 16, and it says, after the death of the sons of Aaron. Mm -hmm. Just to let you know how the narrative is woven together. So when we're, when we're taught, or when the priests are taught at this time, and as we're reading it, that we have to put a difference between the holy and the common, the unclean and the clean, as the book was constructed, we learn about these things that make a difference between the unclean and the clean. But what, what is missing? What also makes somebody unclean? Because 
We have verse chapters 11 through 15, but what else makes somebody unclean? The dead, which we read about where? Numbers chapter 19, just. Mm-hmm. What else can make a person unclean? With, with the dead, right. Uncleanness from the dead. So we have the uncleanness of the unclean beasts. We have, again, a woman when she um, gives birth, STD, flow of seed, menstruation. What else can you become unclean by? Sit behind somebody that's unclean by some of these methods. Not all of these methods, but some of these methods. Can somebody become unclean through something that is clean? Yeah. Huh. Mm-hmm. So if Maury Reiner mentioned the Azazel, that the person that brings it out has to watch before returning to camp. What other way can somebody become unclean through something that is clean? Say that again. If a cow dies of itself and you touch it, do you become unclean? Right. So, this, so again, as we're learning the difference between the unclean and the clean, these things are very important for us to know. So we're going to go into Leviticus chapter 13, or chapters 12 and 13. Sorry, chapters 12 and 13. Then, time permitting, we'll have a discussion on Pesach and Kagmat Sot, uh, because that is coming up soon. We had new moon this week, or, yeah, this week. What day do we have new moon? Amongst this congregation, because we know that there are people that observe it different days. So just to be, just to preface it by this congregation. The eve of the eighth, uh, right, the eve of the eighth, what would be known in the Hebrew as Yom Shalishi, or the evening of Monday that just passed. So while many people were looking for an eclipse, we were celebrating our new year. And so today is what day on of this month? Kamishi. Kamishi, the fifth day of this month, this first month, called Abib. Abib. So, <laughs> so this month is, so that answer people knew. So this month, this month, or according to the Hebrew calendar, or according to the, so, the lunar solar calendar as it is constructed, this month is the month of Abib. It began again Monday evening when there was a new moon that came in. And here we are on the fifth day of the f- first month, the month called Abib. And what happens on the 14th day of the first month? Pesach. And what happens on the 15th day of the first month? Kagmat. So, so therefore we have nine days, if the math is correct, to prepare for Kagmat. So, and that's why it's imperative that, again, time permitting, we'll begin our discussion on Pesach and Kagmat. So the things that we are supposed to be aware of, because it does take some preparation for those that are unfamiliar with Pesach and Kagmatzot, or Passover and the Feast of Eleven Bread, which will begin corresponding to April 22nd in the evening. That's when Kagmatzot will begin. And so for the seven days, started from that point, there has to be all Eleven Bread removed from our homes, and it takes some preparation for that to take place. So again, time permitting, we get into that discussion. Uh, we started that discussion, um, Yom Rishon, um, Sunday during Bible study, We'll go into a much in-depth conversation tomorrow during Bible study on Passover and the Feast of Eleven Bread as well in terms of the things that you should do, should not do, things you should be aware of and not be aware of. So that will definitely be more in-depth tomorrow. So again, time permitting, we'll have a brief discussion of that before we close um, this portion of our service. And also this afternoon, time permitting, after everybody has their fun with cahoots, then um, time permitting, we'll get back into that. So. Save your questions. You could also put your questions out there. In the meantime, you have moderators out there that will capture it so that we can answer them whether later today or tomorrow. So if you have a question that you had in mind, feel free to put it out there. And within 24 hours, you'll get a response, whether this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, you could also email, you could text, whatever means it is to, to get in touch with this congregation. You can ask your questions. So now, Leviticus chapter 12. 
We're in the book of Leviticus, chapter 12, starting from verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jehovah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman be delivered and bear a man child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of the impurity of her sickness shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So this portion is, as Tazria is talking, if a woman be delivered, that's the translation there, or she bears seed, or she's just mm -hmm. giving birth. Right. For common English terminology, she's giving birth. So if she gives birth to a male child, she's unclean for seven days. And it mentions as in the days of the impurity of a sickness, but you read about more in depth in Leviticus chapter 15. Right. So all of the statutes that we read in Leviticus chapter 15 in regards to a woman during the time of menstruation, that seven-day period and the things such as what she touches, who she touches, who touches her, where she sits, somebody sits, where she sits, become unclean, you sit behind her, then you become unclean. Those same rules apply for seven days if she gives birth to a male child. And then for seven days if she gives a male child, and then on the eighth day, because we're talking about a male child right here, that child has to be circumcised based on the covenant that the Most High gave between Abraham, or between himself and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, mm -hmm. where on the eighth day, all males must be circumcised. We read about that in the book of Genesis chapter 17. So it's also imperative that all males be circumcised. This wasn't, if it was not done on the eighth day of your life, get it done as, as soon as possible, because that is how you enter into the covenant with Jehovah God. So regardless of what a religion or what anybody may say against circumcision, the creator of the heavens and the earth said that males must be circumcised on the eighth day. Continue on. And she shall continue in the blood of purification three and thirty days. She shall touch no hollow thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification be fulfilled. So verse 4 talks about something different. So there's seven days as in the impurity of a sickness shall she be unclean. The eighth day, the male child is circumcised. Then she continues for another 33 days in the purification of, the, of or the blood of her purification. And during that time, she don't come into the sanctuary, which is the tent of meeting, which was built by the time that these um, rules I'd be reading about come into play. And until those days are fulfilled, and she should not, she should touch no hollow thing, anything that's holy, she should not touch that during, during those 33 days. But there are separate rules. There's the seven days where she's in the, just like where she has that menstruation cycle. And then there's another 33 days where she's just in the, pure, or the blood for purification, where for those 33 days, she's not allowed to touch anything that's holy or enter into the sanctuary. So there's a difference really between the seven days and 33. However, the teaching is today that you just add the 33 with the seven and you get the 40. And that's where women stay away from any holy service for the 40 days after giving birth to a male child. Then there's a difference if she gives birth to a female child here. We go. Verse five. But if she be a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks as in her impurity, and she shall continue in the blood of purification three score and six days. So she gives birth to a female. She's unclean as in the purity of a sickness for two weeks or 14 days. And then she shall continue in the blood of purification three score and six, 66 days. Mm -hmm. So the time frame is double. And what's missing when she gives birth to a female child that we read about when she gave birth to a male child? No circumcision. There's no circumcision for females contrary to what some people in other continents may do today. Circumcision is only for males. Mm -hmm. So she's unclean for two weeks, then she continues the purification for another 66 days, and now for the next remaining verses or something that cannot be done today because there's no priests that we know of, and we have no temple worship that we can attend to, but this was what we've done by a woman after she gives birth, and after these, whether these 40 days or these 80 days are complete. Continue. And when the days of her purification are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tent of meeting unto the priest. And he shall offer it before Jehovah and make atonement for her. And she shall be cleansed from the fountain of her blood. This is the law of her that beareth, whether a male or a female. And this line that you read here, this is the law for her that beareth, whether, that beareth, whether a male or a female. This section, as we again speaking about in chapters 11 through 15, speaks about different laws that, re, that are in regards to the unclean and the clean. And again, these things are important to make the distinction. When we read at the end of Leviticus chapter 11, in verse 46, it said, This is the law of the beast and of the fowl, 
actually before that, we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 11, starting from verse 44, where it says, For I am Jehovah, your God. Mm -hmm. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of swarming thing that move upon the earth. For I am Jehovah that brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So part of being holy is making that distinction between the unclean and the clean. Mm. So again, you can become unclean and still be holy. It's, it's the fact that you know the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. And knowing the difference between the two means that you're going to make a separation between the two. So when you are unclean, you are separate from those who are clean. But yet both parties are still holy. So again, part of being holy is knowing that, this, that distinction and knowing how to apply that distinction. And then it ends often in chapter 11. This is the law of the beast and of the fowl, of every living creature that moves in the waters and of every creature that swarms upon the earth to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the living thing that may be eaten and the living thing that may not be eaten. So again, these chapters are all in relation to unclean and clean. So that we would know the difference between the two and know how to conduct ourselves when we find ourselves unclean by any of these methods. And therefore, by making that distinction again, we remain holy before the Most High God. Chapter 13. You don't want to finish the 13? Oh, there was another. Go ahead. Verse 8. And if her mean suffice not for a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. So... Good thing we read that. Um, it was mentioned to read that verse. So why is she making atonement mm. after giving birth to a child? Why is she giving a sin offering mm. after giving birth to a child? Because of the blood. No. I didn't hear what you said. Because she was unclean from the blood, okay. No. No. The, say that. Okay, she made a vow while she was pregnant. Well, she cursed during childbirth. That's a popular one. But y'all know what the real answer is, right? We don't know. Because God didn't say so. Good answers, but God didn't say why. <laughs> so what we tend to do is say, we read on the line, That's right. not between the lines, because between the lines is nothing but white space. White space. So good answers, <laughs> but we don't know. But the blood is definitely a good answer, though. Chapter 13. Chapter 13, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jehovah spoke unto Moshe and unto Aharon, saying, when a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, or a scab, or a bright spot, and it become in the skin of his flesh the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aharon the priest, or unto one of his sons the priest. And the priest shall look upon the plague in the skin of the flesh, and if the hair in the plague be turned white, and the appearance of the plague be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is the plague of leprosy. And the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. So this chapter, or this chapter, and the following chapter, which will be discussed more in depth next um, Shabbat speaks on what is translated in English as leprosy. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew word is sara'at. Mm -hmm. And sara'at could mean, for lack of a better term, because it doesn't have a direct um, usage in English, but for lack of a better term, a disease, or the, it, it could be a plague, but there also is another word for plague, which is, what's the word for plague? Nega. That everybody likes to say. <laughs> um, so you have that word, which is for plague, but sara'at could mean plague, it could mean a striking, it could be a disease, it could be a sickness. Mm. It was translated when you got to somewhere along the line into the Greek, where it got related to what the, the Grecians knew as leprosy. But when we read here, the leprosy or the sara'at in chapters 13 and 14 is some sort of surface disorder. Surface disorder meaning as the surface of a skin, the surface of a garment, the surface of a house. So any type of surface disorder is what sara'at is. So when you have these surface, uh, surface disorders, then it has to be taken to the priest, and the priest is the one in this instance determines what is clean and unclean. Whereas in chapter 11, we knew that you were unclean because you ate an unclean 
animal when it died, or you touched the unclean animal when it died. When it came to chapter 12, you know that you're unclean because you gave birth to a child. When you get to chapter 15, you know you're unclean because you had the STD that causes that oozing, or the flow of seed came out of you, or the woman that has the menstruation. But for chapters 13 and 14, what deems the person unclean is the priest. Mm. So if the priest doesn't deem this individual or individuals unclean, then these people or these individuals will still be clean. But when these things appear, individuals have to be taken to the priest to be examined. So what we see in the beginning of this chapter are disorders that come from a few things. It comes from a cut, comes from a burning, or it comes from a boil. Mm -hmm. And if these things are not properly treated or taken care of, then it causes these things to spread. And then that's when it has to be taken to the priest to look at and then the priest would determine whether it's leprosy or not. So there were certain markers that a priest would look in for this one initially, which is a cut. That's why it mentions the word scab. Right. So when the priest would look at this cut and see what is growing out of the flesh of that area of the cut, whether it's something that is below the skin or still on the surface level, and sees what type of hair grows out of it. And based on that, if it's deeper than the skin, and then the, and the hair of that plague turns white, the priest would deem this individual unclean and say that they have leprosy. Continue. Verse 4, and if the bright spot be white in the skin of his flesh, and the appearance thereof be not deeper than the skin, and the hair thereof be not turned white, then the priest shall shut up him that hath the plague seven days. And the priest shall look on him the seventh day, and behold, if the plague stay in his appearance, and the plague be not spread in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up seven days more. And the priest shall look on him again the seventh day, and behold, if the plague be dim, and the plague be not spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. So a scab comes again from a cut. Mm -hmm. So either this cut is going to heal, or, this, or the, the area of the cut is going to spread. Right. So many of us, we have cuts, hands, arms, whatever, and you notice that dim area that is, is, as it's healing, it starts to get dim. But if it's not coming dim and it's starting to spread, that's when the priest would determine either immediately that it's leprosy or they quarantine the individual. Right. So when they first, the priest first looks at it, if it's, a, if it's an area that is not deeper than the skin, then they just quarantine the individual, come back after seven days, see if that area of that flesh of that cut spreads or if it's starting to get smaller. And after the second quarantine period, they see that it's dim, they said the individual is clean, it was just a scab, basically a scab came from the mm. cut. However, in the area of the scab, it just happens. But if the scab spread abroad in the skin, after that he have shown himself to the priest for his cleansing, he shall show himself to the priest again. And the priest shall look, and behold, if the scab be spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is leprosy. So after, becoming, after being declared clean, if that individual notices that that scab area started to grow, they go back to the priest, the priest declares them unclean, and then there's a whole other procedure that they would have to perform in order to become clean, which is, at the, which is actually in the next chapter. Continue. When the plague of leprosy is in the man, then he shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall look, and behold, if there be a white rising in the skin, and if it have turned or hair white, and there be quick raw flesh in the rising, it is an old leprosy in the skin of his flesh, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean. He shall not shut him up, for he is unclean. So this is a separate category. So if something breaks out in the skin, again, this leprosy that's being spoken about in these chapters are all surface disorders or all surface um, issues. So this is something separate. This is not a result of the cut, which became a scab. This is another plague that, uh, that appeared in the individual skin, and they take it, they, they get brought to the priest. The priest sees that there's a white rising in the flesh or in the skin, that, and, the, and the hairs within that area turns white, and then that's when the priest says, you are unclean. So, the, so far, what we're seeing with these, between these different types of leprosy is that the area or the area of the plague or the, of the sickness is below the skin mm -hmm. and or the area in that or the hair in that area turns white. Once you have those markers, based on the, based on the category, that's when the priest determines whether the individual is clean or unclean. Then we have another category that appears here right at the time. And if the leprosy break out abroad in the skin... And the leprosy cover all the skin of him that hath the plague from his head even to his feet, as far as it appeareth to the priest. Then the priest shall look and behold, if the leprosy hath covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean that hath the plague. It is all turned white. He is clean. And this is another category. Again, these are not all connected. Just because the word sarat or leprosy is used to, do, to describe all of these um, maladies, which is also another word, 
These are all separate categories that the priest has to be familiar with in order to determine whether the person is clean or unclean. Just like today, uh, you'd have the priest, you also have people today that are medical individuals that could know the difference between certain things as well, like how we shown last year when he did the presentation and everything and showed people in certain fields would be able to look at some, something and be able to determine exactly what it is. But the, end of the priests have to know these things. Right. And now it doesn't mean that out of, because today you could have hundreds of thousands of priests out of Lana Aaron. It doesn't mean that every one of those priests would know what it, what it to look for. Mm -hmm. But the priests as a, as a whole would have to be trained. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the plague of leprosy, then you would have priests that would specialize in that. Just like you have specialists in various categories and various disciplines today, right. you would have priests that would, have, that would be specialized in, in knowing how to determine these things. But, it does, but again, they would all be trained. But then those that show that they are familiar with the material, they would be the ones that would be the ones to determine what it is. So this is something separate. This leprosy breaks out, and what happens here is that the individual skin turns completely white. So when this condition happens where the individual skin turns completely white, the priest still says the individual is clean because they just, or whatever this is, it turned, but we know that there are certain things such as vitiligo. Mm -hmm. You also have albinism, if mm -hmm. that's the proper way to pronounce it. <laughs> You have these type of um, categories that exist today where somebody's skin would change from a darker complexion mm -hmm. to a lighter complexion. Now, in order for these things to be, term to be determined for somebody to be turned from a darker complexion to a lighter complexion, what complexion were the people that we're talking about here? Hmm. You, you know. Continue. Verse 14. But whensoever royal flesh appeareth in him, he shall be clean. And the priest shall look on the royal flesh and pronounce him unclean. The royal flesh is unclean. It is leprosy. But if the royal flesh again be turned into white, then he shall come unto the priest, and the priest shall look on him. And behold, if the plague be turned into white, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. Th that hath the plague. He is clean. So whatever this condition is that caused the individual to turn from a darker hue to a white hue, and then some area of dark skin or melanin, or darker melanin comes up in a certain area, that individual is unclean because of the fact that that patch of skin is now darker. But if that patch of darker skin turns back white again, now the individual is clean again. Again, this is another category. We, we have actually gotten to our third category of Sarai. Continue. And when the flesh hath in the skin thereof a boy, and it is healed, and in the place of the boy there is a white rising or a bright spot, reddish white, then it shall be shown to the priest. And the priest shall look, and behold, if the appearance thereof be lower than the skin, and the hair thereof be turned white, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is the plague of leprosy. It hath broken out in the boil. So we had the cut. We had the other um, categories there that we have a boil. Now, boils appear especially in areas of, of warmer climate. Uh, many people that live in you know, the Caribbean may be familiar with boils you know, popping up. Or if you're in the Middle Eastern re region, boils popping up. Or even in Africa, the continent of Africa, people get boils. You know, where the climates are uh, warmer and based on the humidity, some people may get boils that way. Some people also get boils through insect bites. There are different methods where somebody can get a boil. So now the boil itself is not what makes somebody unclean. It's what happens when the boil turns into something else. So when the individual you know, gets a boil, they get taken to the priest, and the priest examines that boil to see if where that boil is, is or, the, or what's affecting that boil is lower than the skin, and they see if there's white hairs in that area or not. And that's how they determine whether the person is unclean or clean. And then you don't read about a quarantine period because when it comes to the boil, the priest looks upon it and determines their uncleanliness or cleanliness automatically. Continue. But if the priest look on it, and behold, there be no white hairs therein, and it be not lower than the skin, but be dim, then the priest shall shut him up seven days. Sorry, there was a quarantine period that comes after the priest looks at it. Continue. And if it's spread abroad in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a plague. But if the bright spot stay in its place and be not spread, it is the scar of the boy, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. So there's a scar of the boy. The priest will look at that. So in comparison to what comes happens to the cut, there is a double or two quarantine periods. Mm -hmm. It's also something where the priest is looking for something different. That's how it should have been. The priest is looking for something different. But in the quarantine period for the boil is based on what the priest saw the first time. And where we had the cut, the priest looked at the cut, 
looked if it was deeper than the skin, looked if any white hairs in it, and they said the person is either clean or unclean based on that. Then they, if not, then they quarantine them, see if it spread. And if it doesn't spread even after that, they still quarantine another time. So actually with the board, they only get this, from what we read here, one quarantine period as opposed to possibly two or more quarantine periods with the cut. Continue. Or when the flesh half and the skin thereof are burning by fire, and the quick flesh of the burning become a bright spot, reddish white or white, even the, see God, then the priest shall look upon it, and behold, if the hair and the bright spot be turned white, and the appearance thereof be deeper than the skin, it is leprosy. It hath broken out in the burning, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is the plague of leprosy. So this category comes from now a burning. So if you get burned by any method, any method whether it's directly by the fire, mm -hmm. you touch the hot pot, the iron, the iron mm -hmm. whatever it is, you use the, the hot comb that people used to use back in the days, and then get that line on their um, their, near their hairline, or whatever it is, and messes up their edges, whatever it is. <laughs> you get burned, the priest will look at that area of the burning to look at a certain marker in that burning. So you have the cuts, you have the boil, you now have the burning area. So anything that, play, that, anything that attacked that skin area, the priest is looking for something within that area. But based on the category that it started with, that's how the priest would determine whether the person is clean or unclean. For the, in general, they're looking for something that appears to be deeper than the skin and the hair turning white. But they also, depending on how it started, looking for certain colors in the, in the flesh as well. And then determine whether it requires a quarantine immediately or a determination immediately. That's how it goes. Continue. But if the priest look on it and behold, there be no white hair in the bright spot and it be no lower than the skin, but be dim, then the priest shall shut him up seven days. And the priest shall look upon him the seventh day. If it spread abroad in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is the plague of leprosy. And if the bright spot stay in its place and be not spread in the skin, but be dim, it is the rising of the burning, and the priest shall pronounce him clean, for it is the scar of the burning. So you've got to have a scar again from the burning, a scar from the boil. You've got to have a scar from a cut. And that would still enable the person to be clean. But if there's something going on in those areas and it appears to be deeper in the skin and the hairs are turning to color, the priest has to make a determination based on that. Continue. And when a man or a woman hath a plague upon the head or upon the beard, then the priest shall look on the plague and behold, if the appearance thereof be deeper than the skin and there be in it yellow thin hair, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a skull. It is leprosy of the head or of the beard. So in the head, which is talking about the hair in the head, or the beard, which is, of course, the hair, if in that area there is what is known as a skull, where you have the yellow thin hair appear in those areas, then the individual will be pronounced unclean because they have a skull. So the, whatever, see so again, what, we, what we're looking at here are surface maladies or surface disorders, and also things that appear naturally in individuals, and then the priest will make a determination. So because not everybody's anatomy, anatomy is the same and different things happen at different times, then these individuals will be brought to the priest, mm -hmm. or in some cases not necessarily brought to the priest to see if the person is clean or unclean. But now when they're checking out this skull, this is something that they're going to do. Continue. And if the priest look on the plague of the skull, and behold, the appearance thereof be not deeper than the skin, and there be no black hair in it, then the priest shall shut up him that hath the plague of the skull seven days. And in the seventh day the priest shall look on the plague, and behold, if the skull be not spread, and there be in it no yellow hair, and the appearance of the skull be not deeper than the skin, then he shall be shaven, but the skull shall he not shave, and the priest shall shut up him that hath the skull seven days more. So this procedure, now you're shaving the area around the skull, but you're not shaving the area of the skull itself, which is that area or that patch of skin or that patch of hair, which is sort of scaly. When you look, look at what a skull is, it's a, either the scaly area on the skin where the hair is, and then sort of the hair starts to fall out and change its colors. Continue. And in the seventh day, the priest shall look on the skull, and behold, if the skull be not spread in the skin, and the appearance thereof be not deeper than the skin. Then the priest shall pronounce him clean, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the skull spread abroad in the skin after his cleansing, then the priest shall look on him, and behold, if the skull be spread in the skin, the priest shall not seek for the yellow hair. He is unclean. But if the skull stay in its appearance, and the black hair be grown up therein, the skull is healed, he is clean, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. So again, there's a different procedure when it comes to what the priest is looking for based on the category of how these, um, how these plagues or these maladies start. So with the skull, they check it out, quarantine, 
check it out again. And then now, in certain cases, they're not even looking to see if their hair turns color or not. They could pronounce the individual clean or unclean based on what the area looks like. So now we have individuals that are you know, of a darker hue. You read about a lot of black hair or dark hair versus other types of hues and other colors of hair. Verse 38. And if a man or a woman have in the skin of their flesh bright spots, even white bright spots, then the priest shall look. And behold, if the bright spots in the skin of their flesh be of a dull white, it is a tether. They have broken out in the skin. He is clean. So a tether could be like a pimple or any type of blister that breaks out. So when an individual has these white bright spots that break out, they're still clean. So people that, in, you know, when you're younger and everybody makes fun of, fun of people that are pimple faced and stuff like that, there's nothing wrong with them. They have pimples like, you know, normal teenagers and adolescents get, and even older people as, you know, they get older. Continue. And if a man's hair be fallen off his head, he is bald. Yet he is clean. And if his hair be falling off from the front part of his head, he is forehead bald. Yet he is clean. So now normally when people read that verse, a lot of people start laughing. <laughs> and usually what happens is that the people that laugh at this verse when they're young end up being those people <laughs> when they get older. <laughs> that's usually what happens. So that's why you don't make fun of people when they have their <laughs> thing. But if, any, if somebody has baldness in the front of their head or in the back of their head, it's a normal thing for people that have alopecia, whether it's in the front or in the back. It's something that happens to males and females as they get older due to genetics, due to age, due to stress, due to marriage, due to different <laughs> things. People tend to, to lose their hair. And as a, result, as a result of that, the individual will still be clean even after they get married and lose their hair. So now if something happens in that area of the bald head, this is what the priest is going to look for. But if there be in the bald head or the bald forehead a reddish white plague, it is leprosy breaking out in his bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest shall look upon him, and behold, if the rising of the plague be reddish white in his bald head or in his bald forehead, as the appearance of leprosy in the skin of the flesh, he is a leprous man, he is unclean. The priest shall surely pronounce him unclean, his plague is in his head. So the baldness is not what causes the individual to become unclean. It's what happens in that bald area, whether it's in the forehead or in the, or the top or the back of the head. When something starts popping up in that area, that's when the priest has to check it out to determine whether the person is clean or unclean. So these are the various things. People get cuts, people get burned, people get boils, people go bald. There are different things that happen to individuals, but it's what happens in these areas that these things happen that would determine whether the person is unclean or clean. And it's only the priest that will make that actual determination. And when an individual happens to be declared unclean by the priest, this is what they have to do. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and the hair of his head shall go loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and shall cry, unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague is in him, he shall be unclean. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone without the camp shall his dwelling be. So this is after the priest declares him unclean, he has to do this thing. He has to, he or she has to do this thing. They have to cover their lip and go forth and say unclean, unclean, so that nobody touches them and it gives them an opportunity to go outside of the camp where they are able to dwell alone. And that's why we read in actually the Haftarah, or next week's Haftarah, where you had like a group of lepers that were uh -huh. dwelling outside of the city because right. they had to dwell alone. Right. So do, you know, they'll be like a certain leper colony. Mm -hmm. For people that have any of these methods of sarat or any of these methods of leprosy, they would dwell alone outside of the camp. So while the children of Israel were dwelling in the wilderness, you had the camp, you had the tent of meeting in the center, you had the Levites or the Levitical families um, dwelling around the tent of meeting, then you had the tribes dwelling around the, Le the Levite encampment, and then beyond that, you had people that had leprosy or, or various types of unclean or uncleannesses that had to dwell outside of the entire camp area. And that's, again, how we make a difference between the unclean and the clean, by making that separation. It's, you know, today's terminology, like you hear the word nida. And when you hear the word nida, people tend to use that word specifically for women alone. Mm. But a person that is nida, nida is a Hebrew word that means separate. So how, so both a male, or male and female could be actually nida because they're supposed to be separate, meaning that they're removed from the, the camp, removed from the congregation, removed from the community, only physically. There's no separation between an individual from God mm. when you are unclean. Right. It's a separation exactly. from the community because God walks in the midst of the community or the camp and doesn't want to see any unseemly thing or any unclean thing 
in the midst of the camp. So therefore, those that have a certain uncleanness, by whatever the, the, what the, whatever the method is, have to make that separation from everybody else that is clean. And both parties are holy because they made that distinction between the unclean and the clean. Now we get into a final category of leprosy for our reading this week in this section right here. Verse 47. And when the plague of leprosy is in the garment, whether it be a wool, woolen garment or a linen garment, or in the war, or in the wolf, whether they be of a linen or of a wool, or in, in the skin or anything made of skin, if the plague be greenish or reddish in the garment, or in the skin or in the wolf or in the wolf, or in anything of skin, it is the plague of leprosy and shall be shown unto the priest. And the priest shall look upon the plague and shut up that which hath the plague seven days. And he shall look on the plague on the seventh day. If the plague be spread in the garment or in the warp or in the wolf or in the skin, whatever, whatever service skin is used for, the plague is a malignant leprosy. It is unclean. So again, these are surface disorders. This word sarai is talking about a surface malady or surface disorder. So it's still something that can get a garment, whether the garment is made of wool, whether the garment is made of linen, whether it's in the warp or whether it's in the wolf. Now, what is the warp and what is the wolf? And it has nothing to do with dogs. <laughs> And those that were watching Rishon's presentation last year should remember what the warp and the woof. Yes. <laughs> you remember Shabbat from years ago? To keep it every, every seven days. <laughs> it's part of the material, but the warp and the woof are basically the different directions that when, when people weave material, mm -hmm. any material that you, if you actually look at your material closely, you'll see two patterns. The warp is what goes usually lengthwise one direction, and the woof is what goes across. And because they go across, they cross each other at 90 degree angles, it causes the material to, to stay together, and that's how we have clothes. Mm. If you just have threads going one direction, there's nothing to hold that. Your clothes will just fall apart. Mm. So you have to have the intersection of the warp and the woof. So now before it's put, put together, you're going to have a plague in what is known as the warp or in the woof before it comes together. So now when the priest is looking at it, they're looking at basically this greenish or reddish thing in the leather or in the wool or in the linen garment or the warp and the woof. And today you may know these things as, when it comes to clothing, right, mold mm -hmm. or mildew, mm -hmm. which is a difference. The mildew is on the surface. You could sort of clean mildew easily. Mold is a stronger, both are fungi, fun guys. <laughs> Yeah, fun guys. But fun guy. It's already plural. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say fun guys. <laughs> See, they thought it was funny. That's that that was the point. Shabbat shalom. Anyway, so what they're looking for, so mildew is what's on the surface. You can sort of wash it off easily, but if you have a mold condition, it takes more um, dedication for lack of a better term to get rid of mold. It's like if you're in the, in the house, which you read about in the next chapter, mildew, you get it on your walls and the tiles or whatever, you can sort of wipe it off. If you have a mold condition, it's a little bit more serious because it's more in there. So these were the things that the priests were looking for when it comes to the garments, whether the wool or linen or the warp or the woof. Continue. And he shall burn the garment or the warp or the woof, whether it be of wool or of linen or of anything of skin wherein the plague is. For it is a malignant leprosy. It shall be burnt in the fire. And, the, and if the priest shall look and behold, the plague be not spread in the garment, or in the warp, or in the wolf, or in anything of skin, then the priest shall command that they wash the thing wherein the plague is, and he shall shut it up seven days more. So now what happens today, we look at this and be like, well, why don't they just throw it away in the first place? Mm -hmm. Because we happen to be happy slaves that we can mm -hmm. buy as much clothes as we want to. But when you live in a society where clothes are valuable, some people may just want to remove that patch of area that is affected and not want to burn the entire thing. Or if it gets to a certain situation where you have to burn every entire thing, then that's when it becomes a problem. Just like when you read in the next chapter where they have to just break down a house. But again, so that this may not apply or, or seem to apply because we just tend to buy clothes at random and throw clothes away. You know, people have closets full of clothes, and if something attaches one garment, you know, sisters are shaking their head, just throw one, you know, one garment out and somebody else will buy you another one because you think that the husband just has so much money that he could just buy you more shoes and more. <laughs> and so when they throw it in the bag, then you get the leprosy in the bag as well, and that's what happens. 
And the priest shall look after that the plague is washed. And behold, if the plague have not changed its color, and the plague be not spread, it is unclean. Thou shalt burn it in the fire, it is a fret, whether the bareness be within or without. So now what they're looking for is for the, the parents to change. And if it's not changing, then they would declare it unclean. As opposed to with an individual, you're looking for that dimness to come in. You're looking for it to get dim. You're looking for it to get smaller. If it's just remaining the same in the garment, it's declared unclean. So based on the situation, that's what the priest would be looking for different things. Continue. And if the priest look and behold, the plague be dim. After the washing thereof, then he shall rend it out of the garment, or out of the skin, or out of the wolf, or out of the wolf. And if it appears still in the garment, or in the wolf, or in the wolf, or in anything of skin, it is breaking out. Thou shalt burn that wherein the plague is with fire. And the garment, or the wolf, or the wolf, or whatsoever thing of skin it be, which thou shalt wash, if the plague be departed from then, then it shall be washed the second time, and shall be clean. So now what we do, what is one important thing that we learn from this? Wash. Yourself, your clothes. Make, when it comes to the distinction between unclean and clean, washing is very important. Washing solves a lot of problems. Washing prevents a lot of sicknesses. Washing prevents a lot of illnesses. And just because you may wash yourself and your garments a lot and your house and everything a lot, especially during this time where you have the passive cleaning, which everybody tends to dread, but if you come in contact with people that are not so clean, then whatever stuff they have still deals, you know, that's why they have to make a separation between the unclean and the clean. Because no matter how clean or meticulous you may keep yourself and your clothes and your house or whatever it is, you know, you have no control, or full control over other people. And that's why separation for certain things is very important because washing is very important. And that's why we are generally a very clean people, you know, Kudos to us. You know, we go to the bathroom, we wash our hands. You see other people go to the bathroom and walk straight out because they see the sign in the bathroom, employees wash your hands, and they say, I don't work here. So (laughs) they feel that I could just walk out the bathroom, and that's that's what it is. So because of that and certain things remain in people's hands that after they use the bathroom, they didn't wash it, they touch you, you end up getting stuff, even though everything ringworm, everything, because mm-hmm. measles, everything, because people aren't clean. And in conclusion. This is the law of the plague of leprosy in the garment of wool or linen or in the wool or in the wool or in anything of skin to pronounce it clean or to pronounce it unclean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we give praise and honor to the Most High, thanking him for this opportunity to call upon his name. With a little bit of time, we're just going to talk about Passover and the Feast of Eleven Bread. We'll save the questions possibly for later, but definitely tomorrow. Um, so in the discussion of Passover, because this is a season where everybody needs to be ready and needs to be prepared, this is a season where everybody should also be happy to take part in because it also denotes our 10 more minutes here. That's why we just yeah, can sit down for a little bit. It denotes our freedom from the land of Egypt, and we're supposed to be happy and we're supposed to be joyous during this season, during this occasion. Just like many people, when they celebrate their um, seasons, you see people post all types of food that they're cooking, post about their preparation, people prepare for Thanksgiving, and they get all joyous. But we have to show that we have joy in our seasons, you know, seasons, you know, even beyond what everybody else is doing, because this is actually a celebration of our release mm-hmm. from Egypt. This is a celebration of the fact that the Most High God separated us from the Egyptians. He did something for us that he did not do for anybody else on the face of the earth. And because of that, we have to be proud of our God. Not proud of ourselves, because we didn't do anything. The most we did was just kill a lamb and goat, put the blood in the doorpost, and stayed inside. Mm -hmm. But the Most High God is the one that passed over all the homes of Egypt and slew the firstborn of man and beast. And only he knew exactly who was the firstborn of every man and every beast. So this was something that nobody can do. It was an attack on the gods of Egypt and the Egyptian gods were not able to do anything because they do not exist. Right. And that's how the Jehovah God was able to show into the face of the children of Israel and the Egyptians who he is versus who those deities are. So we're going to just touch in certain areas in chapter 12. We're not going through the entire chapter. But because we mentioned that this is the first month, which began Monday evening, this is the fifth day of the month, we have to know how is it significant for us? So Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jehovah spoke unto Moshe and Aharon in the land of Egypt, saying, 
This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And that's very important because it's the first year of the month unto us. So no matter what anybody else says is New right. Year, Abib is the first, first of the the first of the months for us. That's right. We only have one beginning of months. Mm -hmm. We only yeah. have one beginning right. of the year for us. Other nations may have their new years, but the children of Israel only had the one that Jehovah God specified. And there was no difference. The people knew how to tell what a month is based on the new moon. God just said that this month that we're coming out of Egypt is the new year for us or the beginning of the month for us mm -hmm. because it signifies our, quote, unquote, freedom, our birth as a nation. Mm. So we're celebrating our, it's just like, July 4th for the United States is Independence Day, and that's what they celebrate as the beginning of the nation for them, even though many of us get wrapped up in it because we're here, and our ancestors were still slaves on July 4th, 1776 anyway, but we have to show more pride in our days more than anybody else's day. So, you know, we expect to see some firecrackers and some fireworks later on today. Tonight. Oh, yeah, tonight. <laughs> Just to yeah, clarify, we expect firecrackers, stuff, firecrackers, fireworks gonna be happening. Y'all gonna be lighting up, shoot some stuff out there. Or y'all could just drive past fast, because they have a new camera here, so y'all can just drive fast and let, and let it flat, let it flash here. Yeah. Just cover your plate, but you can just drive back and forth, let it flash, and that'd be, that'd be good enough. But we need some, some fireworks and some. Yeah. We're not gang gang here. Okay. <laughs> We're going to jump to verse because what happened is that they killed the lamb at dusk, roasted it. They were supposed to eat it that night, which is the 14th day of the first month, and that's where they had the Passover lamb. And verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, Roast with fire and unleavened bread. With bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire its head with its legs and with its inwards thereof. So this is talking about the Passover lamb or the goat, because it could be from the lamb or the goats. And they would slay this beast, roast it entirely. And on this night in Egypt, they had to eat it with bitter herbs and with unleavened bread. Mm -hmm. So what is unleavened bread? Just the unleavened bread, nothing, nothing else beyond what we may talk about today, but just the unleavened bread. Bread that has, right, that hasn't been, hasn't been fermented. So that night they ate the lamb or the goat with the unleavened bread and with the bitter herbs. What are bitter herbs? You have horseradish, lettuce, endives, aloe. I'm hearing some different things right now. Here in Cerisee. So the common one, ancient, yeah, that's, that's um, bitter melon or Cerisee, depending on which region you're born in, you'll call that bitter melon, Karali. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah, the same. Yeah, it depends. It's like, like a popular one. Like, what is a fig? It had a little bitter herb. What is a fig? Big old grape. Like a tamarind, that's what they're saying. Are we showing this in the hallway? Oh, he left. Anybody? Do you call fig something else? <laughs> right. Right. Like a, oh, that's what y'all call it. Has anybody called a banana fig? Right. Right. So if you're in America, a fig is different than a fig in the Caribbean. A banana is a fig in the Caribbean. So regions call different things, no, different regions call things different. So that's why even when it comes to research and history, it's also important to know geography and the history of the, of the people in those areas. Mm -hmm. Because people call different things by different names. That's why when reading the Holy Scriptures, as we start to wrap up, when we're reading the Holy Scriptures, we're reading the Holy Scriptures translated into an old English. So what people in England may call certain things, that's what they translate to certain things too. That may not exactly be what it is to us today. Like you read about the meat offering, but you read that the meat offering is grain because in Old English, grain was called meat. Mm. So that's why certain words start 
throw people off because based on the translator or the translation of that time, that's how certain things come into play. It's like corn. Corn was, is actually grain in Old English. So they would refer to wheat and barley and stuff like that as corn, where in the United States, corn is maize. So that's why these various things are very important for us to know. Now, getting back to the bitter herb, it's popular to use in the United States horseradish because there is a larger population of Ashkenazi Jews in the United States compared to everybody else. If you're in a living in a different region, whether amongst the Sephardic or amongst the Mizraki, then you would use the romaine lettuce because the Romanian lettuce is actually what is indigenous to Egypt. When it came to Ashkenazi Jews in Germany, lettuce was not able to grow, at that time, survive the winter. So they made a rabbinic ruling to say, we're gonna use horseradish instead of what is actually known as lettuce or endives. Those, that was the actual original bitter herb. Mm. Now the bitter herb is, and also look at the translation. You don't see the word esev in the translation. The word is maror, right. which is one word, and because at that time also they translated maro as made it something that's related to mar, which is bitter, they also chose the horseradish. What happens when you chew horseradish? It's not bitter, but what happens when you chew it? It causes, it opens your pores and what else happens? It causes your eyes to tear. So they also said we're gonna use, they said they're gonna use the horseradish because it brings the tears to remind them of the bondage of Egypt. It had nothing to do with the actual moral that we read about in scripture. There's a lot of things that we do that are inherently, unfortunately, Jewish, but when you see the culture where it comes from and why they came up with certain things, and you realize why things were done, and then as we go along, how we have to wean ourselves away from certain things. So the, the bitter herb actually anciently, word that was just made up, anciently, it would be the romaine lettuce, which was indigenous to Egypt, and the endive as well. Also, you have dandelion and chicory, which is also thrown in that mix as well. Yeah, yeah. How are they also using like scratch the brick off the wall and put it in there? The mix? Yeah. I'm not familiar. I'm not saying no, but I'm not familiar with that. But what you would also notice is that when it comes to a passive a seder dish, they would have the horseradish. They would also have the. They would have different things to signify mm -hmm. the, the better herbs. We just happen to just pick one, but they actually have a mixture of things. So is the horseradish actually a bitter herb? No, it's not a, it's not a bitter herb. <laughs> it was something that they chose to do because, again, the lettuce was not growing in Germany. So they had to make a rabbinic rule to say, well, we need something to replace the lettuce. And they came up with the horseradish. Horseradish is actually known as a, also a sea radish because it grows near the sea. Some people call it a horse because of the size of root. It's not a... Even if you use the term herb, it's not an herb because it's a root. Yeah. 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 We should start. It would be safe. Now, the thing is, when it comes to changing up certain things, it's a matter of whether people are prepared for that change. But that's, you know, with change, you know, it comes with preparation. But that's why discussions, and then, because all you really would need technically is a salad. To go with your, <laughs> to go with your um, your lamb and your unleavened bread. Okay, so I'll start to um, two words. My opinion, I would say no. Okay. Yeah, I would just go with what, what was used in ancient times for that, which with the lettuce and dives and the things like that. And it's some, at some point in history. Da uh, not the dandelion itself, but some variation of the dandelion. What, what endives and lettuce can we get here? Um, you have ro romaine lettuce and endives. You could get endives. And we've been getting endives the past few years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the, wait, the romaine lettuce is good. And then the, endi the endives, you'll see it's, it'll have the leaves sort of like, a, like lettuce, but it's a smaller vegetable but we've we've had in the past few years almost five seven years so far in, in the mix change is good 
Change is always good. When you find out information, change is always good. Change is always good. Hey, change is always good. <laughs> yeah. Wait. Oh. Okay, what does... Right. Right. And that's, and that's what that's what they chose. But read verse, read verse, read verse eight again. Read verse eight again. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. With bitter herbs they shall eat it. Why do we eat the bitter herb? Who told you that? That's the question. That's somebody else's tradition. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, in regards to with the so now we have the lamb, which today because we don't have sacrifices, people do eat lamb during that night to signify the fact that um, lamb was eaten or would be eaten generations. But we don't have a uh, sacrifice; we can't do sacrifices in foreign lands, and we don't have the priests. We don't have the tent of meeting or the temple either. Those things. So, and based on Leviticus. 17 and Deuteronomy 12, we can't do sacrifices. So we don't have a Passover offering today. Just to clarify in terms of the lamb. Nothing wrong with eating lamb for Passover at all in remembrance of this, of or signifying what would be done. But again, it's not the actual offering. So you don't have to go to the methods of roasting it whole, worrying about breaking bones, different things like that, because it's not the sacrifice. And then the unleavened bread, which is, as we mentioned, the bread made without certain ingredients that would cause it to ferment making it without the baking powder, making it without the yeast. Also, an uh, method was using balm to make bread rise. It would be akin to what we know today as sourdough bread. So you would have sourdough bread, they would have a sourdough starter, which is basically a mixture of flour and water. Some people use jars today and to cultivate that, and then they take some of the sourdough starter, put it in a different, in a new batch of dough that they're making, and they would bake it, and that's what causes that, what we know to, we don't call it leavened bread, we just call it bread, but that's how originally bread was made leavened through the sourdough making process or the barn process in ancient times. Okay, you mentioned fermented. Mm-hmm. What is fermented? Fermented, fermented and something rising, isn't that two different things? It's two different things, right. So the ferment, so that, that relates to the document, again, and now we are speaking with the little time we have left. In terms of how this congregation observed Kagmatsu, or the Feast of Eleven Bread, we know that different congregations, different families, different houses, different communities observe it differently. So that's why on the website for Bay DCB, you go to the bottom of the website, there's going to be a link for a Passover document, and you're going to see the document that lists the ingredients. It speaks about Passover and the Feast of Eleven Bread, and also speaks about the ingredients that we avoid during the season. Because again, when briefly, just to read verse. 20, sorry, verse 15. Actually, read 14 quick and then read verse 15. Yeah. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to Yehovah. Throughout your generations, you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. That's the first day of the Feast of Eleven Bread, which is the 15th day of the first month. And then, verse 15, you Yeah, verse 15 now. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. How be it? The first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So from the first day to the seventh day of that feast of leavened bread, we're not supposed to eat any leavened bread. We're supposed to remove all leavened bread from our homes and remove all forms of leavening, which would be the things that cause that bread to ferment or cause that, cause, to use a technical term, cause the bread to ferment, which, in, which, is, which is by vision is rising. But what happens is that dough is fermenting. But as you know, your question is in terms of what the fermenting arises is two different things. Yes, it's two different things. Because fermentation process is an actual process. What's in it that's making the ferment. Because if we drink apple juice, that goes to a Right. And it doesn't rise. Right. right. But still, but when you say fermenting, you know, certain fruits do that naturally. Mm-hmm. If I unpeel a uh, banana and I go to one room and come back, and then still, it starts turning brown, that's fermentation. Fermentation, right. So it doesn't mean it's no good for a Right, it doesn't mean, right, right. So that's why the fermentation, especially when it comes to the Feast of the Bread, is in regards to the bread alone. So the technical term would be fermentation in regards to the bread or the dough alone. Yes, as you mentioned, every, a lot of things would ferment. But in terms of what is spoken about during the season, it would be the bread. 
that goes to that rising process or that fermentation process to be more technical during that season. So that's why, um, in, as we had to mention it now, people may have questions. We may get to the questions later on or definitely tomorrow. But we, on the fifth day of the first month, we have nine days to prepare for the Feast of Eleven Bread. So it's imperative that we prepare ourselves for that season by removing certain things from our homes. Again, there's a document on the Bait DCB website that lists the leavening agents as we would know them today. That should be removed completely from your homes before that season comes in for those seven days. Primarily, you're talking about, say, oh, tomorrow at 9 a.m. or 9, sometimes 9.15, because Chief Uziel does a lot on Yom Rishon. He does a lot of recordings of Crown Prince, then he does the Bible study, then he has another meeting. So it's between 9 and 9.15. It's officially 9, but sometimes we might. So if it's not 9 o'clock, just hang on. We'll get on. So in the morning for the weekly Bible study, we're going to talk about Passover the Feast of Eleven Bread. But it's imperative, at least walking away today, to know the ingredients that you're supposed to be removed from your homes, which is primarily the baker's yeast. Um, primarily, most of us don't do balm. And baking soda, baking powder. Now, the other things, such as that you mentioned, like vinegar, wines, because some of those um, items are started with a yeast product, because you have like a wine yeast, you also have a cheese yeast, you also have, there are yeast that's used in different products to make those processes be what they are. So that's why, in general, for the season, we stay away from certain things, such as certain alcohols that may have had yeast introduced in the making of the process just for the safety aspect. But what we teach at this congregation is that the removal of the leavened bread and the leavening agents is what is key, just to avoid some of the other confusion and everything. So again, the, le the list is there. People can um, download it, read it, and we can get into it at another time. So we are grateful to the Most High for allowing us to reach this season, praying that he would allow us to enjoy this season as he's coming in, that we would enjoy the preparation of his season, and the cleaning of, you know, some people may not enjoy cleaning, you know, the house as much, but, you know, we have to do these things to get rid of the leavening. But if you, if you do it throughout the year, if, right, you shouldn't be too much. So praying that the Most High God has guided us all, that he would teach the truth, that we would not lead astray nor be led astray at this time. Hallelujah. 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 Give all honor and praise, respect, glory, and allegiance to our God and our King, the Holy One, the only one of Yisrael. Thanking our brother, Rav Benyamin Ben Benyamin, for his dissertation on the Seder this day. Praying that the Most High God will find all that we've done so far acceptable, even in the highest, highest courts of his glory, and that the Most High God will bless us all and keep us all. Brothers and sisters, I did not get to say Lashana Tova to everyone. It is indeed an honor that the Most High God has bestowed unto us to allow us to see another year from last Aviv to this Aviv. This is a blessed thing. The Most High God is great unto us. The Most High God has shown us kindness and love and mercy. We have to give thanks and praise to his high and his most holy name. So before we break for lunch, we have to give thanks and praise to this almighty king. Let us even sing the song, Baruch Hashem. Hallelujah. Baruch Hashem. Shell Yahoo, Baruch Hey! 
And Yehovah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto Aharon and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, ye shall say unto them, Yevareka Yehovah Ishmareka, Yair Yehovah Panaoleka Wikuneka, Yisa Yehovah Panaoleka Weyasem Leka Shalom, Yehovah bless thee and keep thee, Yehovah make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yehovah lift up his countenance upon thee and grant thee peace. The Samuel Shemi Abane Israel with Ani Avarakim. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh 
So come back with your singing voices, ready to praise y'all. It is our new year, brothers and sisters. So we have to give thanks and praise to this great and magnificent king. Remember the Shabbat day, keep it holy. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.